Hello, everyone. My name is Paris. I'm a product manager at Android Studio working on design tools. And I'm Jerome. I'm a software engineer uh, on Android Studio working on design tools. As you know, Android apps are now used on more and more devices, from phones to tablets, wearables, and even desktop through Chrome OS. And so it's more important than ever for app developers like you to make sure that your app looks good and have provide the user a great experience across all those devices. And today, we are going to talk to you about some of the tools that we built in Android Studio to help you achieve that. The first thing I want to talk to you about is window size classes. We know there is a wide variety of devices out there, various sizes, and so to help you deal with that diversity, we've created window size classes. Basically, it's three buckets of sizes that help you figure out how to think of your app across different device sizes. So as a first step to thinking of building your app for all devices, you should think of how should my app look like on compact devices, medium devices, and expanded devices. Window size classes exist both for width and height, though really the width component is the most important to think of. So how would you handle this if you're working with a view-based layout system? First of all, if you're working with a layout, you probably want to preview it across different devices to see how does it look like on a phone, maybe a larger screen, to help you with that, in the layout editor, in the device picker, we've added what we call reference devices. Those devices are what we think are good representative of the variety of devices out there and are a good first step to uh, look at your layout and see if they look good already on those four devices. We have a phone an unfolded foldable, a tablet, and a desktop. For example, if I select the tablet layout, you can now see that my uh, layout is uh, displayed on a tablet screen. Here I use a two-column layout, which is a pretty good choice for a larger screen compared to the uh, one-column uh, list layout that we used for the phone. But you might be wondering, is there anything I can do better on this layout to make sure that it looks good and is as user-friendly as possible on all devices. To help you with that, we've added a new type of lint checks that we call visual linting. Where can you see that? Well, where you would normally look for lint checks, here you see that I have a warning. If I click on it, it will open the error panel and show a new type of warning category that we call layout validation. What are those warnings? What happens is in the background, we render the layout you're currently looking at on the four reference devices, the phone, the foldable, the tablet, and the desktop. And once we have those renderings, we analyze them to try and detect possible errors and design issues that we could warn you about, and this is one of those. This one says, oh, you shouldn't use bottom navigation bar on larger screen. If I click on the error, I get some extra information. I can even have access to uh, links to uh, the material design guidelines, for example. And in addition, if I double click on the issue, I can see the layout validation. The new panel that opens displays my layout across four different reference devices and highlights the one that have the issue. So here it's the foldable, the tablet, and the desktop. Why? Because those three uh, screens have, are either in the medium or expanded window size class. And really, they shouldn't be using a bottom navigation bar. How should we fix that? 
Well, one possibility would be to uh, create new layouts using the uh, width uh, layout qualifier for medium and expanded screens and replace the bottom navigation bar with, for example, a navigation rail. Once I do that, I can see that I now don't have any errors anymore. And in addition, if I were to open the layout validation panel, then you would see all my uh, layouts displayed with the phone still using the bottom navigation bar, but for example, the foldable now correctly has the navigation rail. And you notice that it's not highlighted anymore because we fixed the error. So the layout validation allows you to quickly see your layout on all the four devices and see as a first check if it looks as you would expect. So for view-based layout, we've added those new visual linting lint checks that are basically helping you with identifying potential issues with your layout across form factors and also help you keep up with the current best practices. And thanks to the layout validation, you can easily display your layout to check that they behave as you intend. Now, if you work with Compose, dealing with window size classes is even easier. Thanks to the uh, Material 3 window size class library, you have access to a window size class object that you can pass to your composable. Inside that object, you can very uh, easily just check what is the window size class, either width or height. And here, for example, I can check, am I in the case where I'm in the compact width category? If yes, use a bottom navigation bar. If not, use a navigation rail. And in my main activity, how do I pass this uh, window size class object? to my composable, where it's very easy. Again, thanks to the Material 3 library, you can have access to a utility method that helps you compute the uh, window size class from the activity. We know that in view-based layouts, you have the preview. It would be nice if we could also use the Compose preview to check that our layout reacts correctly on window size classes. And indeed, we can do that. First of all, we need to set up the preview annotation, selecting a device. Here I chose the phone reference device. And then I can simply get the configuration from the uh, local device, get the screen size from the configuration, and then again, thanks to the Material 3 library, I have an easy way to compute the window size class from the device size. I can then simply pass it to my composable that I want to preview, and here is how it works. So here I have the phone preview, but if I replace it with the foldable, then you will see how my screen updates to the foldable, and then I can check how it would look like on a tablet, for example, and here it is. Now, we might also want to have something akin to layout validation in Compose, that is displaying several previews at once, and check that, for example, my layout handles correctly different window size classes and see it on the same screen. That's very easy using Compose Multi Preview. You can define new annotations that are basically a list of previews that will be applied to any composable that I annotate. So here I define four preview categories. We have uh, several ways of defining uh, preview categories with devices. Here I show you a few. You can use the recommended devices, like phone or foldable. If you have a specific device in mind, we also have uh, a specific way of providing an exact configuration for a device. Or you can, we have predefined configurations as well of already existing device. And to help you with that, Android Studio has auto-completion and error validation to help you uh, define those. If I just list all my previews and then create uh, a new annotation here called reference devices, then I can simply replace in the uh, code my pre previous preview annotation for a single device with reference devices. And now you can see that my preview 
is now several screens together of the same composable. If I just rearrange it so that we see it better, you can now see all the screens that I defined previously. So you can see if your composable does indeed react as you might expect on, based on different window size classes, for example. But of course, that's not limited to window size classes. You can do many different kinds of configurations uh, that you might want to check for themes, font scaling, anything you might want to check. So to recap, for uh, Compose tools, we have an easy way to deal with window size classes, and that is using the Material 3 window size class library. It provides you with very easy to use APIs so that you don't have to think of like how to deal uh, with that yourself. And then, thanks to the Compose Multi Preview, uh, you can easily preview any number of configurations and check that your composable indeed works as intended across multiple devices. In addition, uh, the nice thing about the pre multi-preview annotation is that not only can you use it on one composable, once it's defined, you can use it on several. So you can preview again and again on the same configuration several different composables. Let me now invite Paris back to the stage to talk about the latest in the emulator. Thank you, Jerome. Awesome. Now that you've learned about Studio Tools for building adaptive UIs, let's talk a little bit about deployment tools. Let's say I want to check the layouts that Jerome just built on my running device to see if it actually works across different string sizes. What I have to do is actually launch three different emulators and try to swap between them to see what's going on which can be a little inconvenient. Thus, we now recommend just one emulator, the resizable emulator, which lets you quickly toggle between the three reference devices, phone, foldable, and tablets, to make it easier to both validate your layout and test the behavior at runtime. Let's see, for example, I can quickly toggle to see that my bottom navigation bar on a phone switches to a nav route when I switch to a foldable. I can interact and test the app a little bit, then switch to a larger tablet and see that the state of the navigation is updated as well as test the different list detail view. In a foldable state, I can even launch two apps at the same time to split screen, so I can see if my apps cor reacts correctly to multitasking experiences. You can see here as I scroll through the tracker app to look at my to-dos, then go to YouTube to watch Android Dev Summit online and in person here. Moreover, we also want your applications to look and work great right on desktop, especially Chromebooks. Thus, we've also introduced three new desktop AVDs. You can now deploy your app to small, medium, and large AVDs. One really cool thing I like to do here is actually, if you deploy this tracker app to the desktop application, you can see that I can resize the app and see the transition state. For example, you can see the text is wrapping the way that I would expect. It's updating the navigation uh, as I switch between different screen sizes. And the transition state is what I would like. Now, you may also be wondering, what about Wear OS apps? Especially now we have this shiny new Pixel Watch. Actually, building for Wear OS apps have never been easier for, with Android Studio. You can now leverage a lot of what you just learned about adapt, building for adapted apps into building for the wrist. So let's take a look. First of all, starting with what you just learned from Jerome about visual linting, like for large screen, we've actually built in design time lints to help identify common issues when you're building for your Wear OS layouts. As an example here, it's recommended to have a minimum margin uh, for 2.5% for a square watch face and a 5.2% for a round watch face. So if you build a layout that looks something like this, where the text is too close to the edge of the watch face, our tools will warn you. You can see on the right here in the layout validation window, we've flagged uh, warnings on layouts that we think that doesn't look correct on the device sets. 
In the bottom, the problems panel gives you more information about what that error is and how you'll be able to correct it. If you're using Compose, which I hope you are, you might note that back in July, Compose for Wear OS has just launched 1.0. So if you start using Compose to build Wear OS layouts, you can now use Compose Preview, Multi Preview, just as you would normally. For example, you can create Compose Previews that are different Wear OS devices. You can, in this case, I've created three, uh, large round, small round, and square. And I can put them, uh, just like what uh, Jerome just did, into a Multi Preview class, in this case called Wear Preview Devices. And if I apply that to any Wear Composables, um, in this case, I pick a volume screen preview UI, you can see that I can iterate and see my preview side by side as I build my Compose UI. Let's say you've finished building and creating different Wear OS uh, UI, and you're ready to deploy and debug your Wear OS services. You can now leverage something called direct service launch. In the latest version of Ender Studio, we now support deploying tiles and complications directly. Let me walk you through an example about how you can deploy a Wear tiles. So now for any of your Wear OS services, you will see this Run icon in the gutter right next to it. And all you have to do is really one click on that tile, and it will automatically create the correct configuration and run on your watch emulator. So if we see this in action, I have a sample tile services. I click on that run icon. You can see on the top that a configuration is automatically created. And boom, the tile is launched on the watch emulator. You can launch multiple tiles, complications. In this case, I have a couple already. And we believe that this will actually make building tiles and complications much more easier. We have also added four new buttons to the Wear OS emulators toolbar to resemble hardware controls and test physical behaviors. So to walk you through, bottom one is for launcher, bottom two is for home, palm is to move the watch to an ambient state, and tilt is to indicate whether or not the user is looking at the watch. This way, you can test hardware-specific behaviors that are targeted for your app without actually running it on the physical watch and trying to do the tilt motion yourself. Finally, if you don't know already, we launched the Wear OS Pairing Assistant back in Ender Studio Arctic Fox and have done a lot of improvements since then. We now make it easier to manage and connect Wear OS emulators. You can pair multiple Wear OS devices with a single virtual or physical device. Ender Studio also remembers previously paired states so that you can pair again when you launch uh, the emulators and is tightly integrated with the device manager. You can see here, I have a phone and a watch emulator. I can use the device manager dropdown to pair the wearable. That step-by-step -step dialog will show up. You can choose which watch you want to pair. It will actually check requirements that you need. In this case, I don't have the Wear OS app installed on the phone, so let me go ahead and install it on this emulator. Once I do, it's uh, successfully paired. So if I go into the phone and actually open this Wear OS um, app, you can see that everything is set up and the correct Wear OS emulator is connected. The device manager also shows you the statuses of that pair uh, state. All right, we know that was actually a lot of tools that we just run through really quickly. So here's a list of everything we've talked about today. You can visit these two links to check out and learn more resources and information about building for large screen and Wear OS. We hope that after this talk, no matter if you're building for views or compose, large or small screen, you can leverage these tools in Ender Studio and start building for multi-device today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Jacobson, and I'm a product manager on the Android developer team, specifically focused on the developer experiences for large screens and foldables. I'm Cara Vallarri, engineering manager. I run most of the UI teams. Um, before we get into this talk today, first, why don't we take a look at why you should care about large screens? 
Um, Right now, there are more than a quarter billion active devices, uh, active large screen devices running Android, meaning there's hundreds of millions of reasons for you to improve your application experiences to delight your users. And when we talk about large screens, we're specifically referring to tablets, desktop class devices like Chromebooks, and large foldable devices. And one of the things that I'm really excited about in this talk especially is that many of the tips and tricks that we're going to share that you should be able to use today are actually learnings from when we did the work ourselves in many of our first party applications. We've made a lot of mistakes along the way. We've learned from them. We've updated our guidance. And we want to share that with you so that you can kind of jump ahead and accelerate your development and not make the same mistakes. Um, additionally, if you're looking for inspiration within your own applications, try out your favorite Google app, see some of the things that we have done to improve our experiences on these devices. And you can kind of learn from that and take that into your own application. But before we go into some practical do's and don'ts, we thought we'd talk about design and quality so that we set the stage for what we're trying to achieve when we say we should support large screens. When an app does nothing to support large screen devices, it may end up looking something like this. And it basically means this UI has done no effort to, for example, think of layout. Um, we see a lot of the large screen support. There's many aspects to it, but a huge part of it comes down to UI and layout and how your app looks on a larger screen. For that, um, we heard loud and clear from both developers and designers of you needed more guidance, right? Like there's a lot more real estate to fill, for example, when your app is running on a tablet or a desktop device. So how do you fill that space is, is a hard question. And so we've been working really hard on giving you a lot of guidance. And so the Material Design website has a bunch of new information around adaptive design and what are the different things that you can think about to really not just blow up your app, but use that space smartly. One of the areas I really want to point out, because it's going to be really important, is canonical layouts. And we call canonical layouts an exercise that we did of looking at apps that support large screen in the wild and look at our, could we distill it into typical app structures that we could then recommend back, right? So what are the typical structures that apps are actually using that really work and help you place the information into the screen in a way that makes sense? For example, if you have your content in more of a parent-child sort of relationship, so say you have a list of emails and then an open email, that kind of relationship is very well described by what we call a list detail layout, where you place, when there's enough space, you could place these side by side and you convey the hierarchy of your information. Um, but also it allows us to say, well, when there's less space, we probably only show the detail, right? So this is one structure to think about and think of that kind of hierarchical relationship between your content. If instead your content has more of kind of a main content and supporting content sort of relationship, then you can use a supporting panel. And think, for example, YouTube does this. Like you have the main player, and that's a really important piece. But maybe you have playlists and other things. And these are supporting content that when the space gets more reduced, you may want to deprioritize, either hide or move somewhere else. And then supporting panel helps you think of that. Like how do we keep space for a main content, but still have supporting content that exists? And finally, the third layout that we really came to was feed. And it, this comes out when you have different items in your content, but they're all kind of siblings. They're all similar things. Sure, one may be something you want to represent a bit bigger than the other, but they're siblings. They're all part of the same information hierarchy. In that case, you end up with a feed. And think of like news app, right? Like you have different articles, and you want to show them all on the screen. And so you would end up using these kind of grid layouts that really allow you to say, well, Little space, I'm going to do one column. But if there's more space, we can show them side by side and use kind of more smart use of space. Because we know there's a lot of developers in the room, uh, we're going to say we did um, just announce a new guide on developer.android.com that goes into the three layouts I just mentioned and then how to implement them, both in views and compose. So hopefully, we're giving you a lot of pointers of if this makes sense and if this inspires you on how to fill in the screen, well, here's how you action on that and how you actually implement it. OK, so I talked a lot about design, but then I said I would talk about quality, right? And how does this relate to quality? Well, we've published what we call the Large Screen App Quality Guidelines. And these are a set of tiers that we defined that helps us reason how does an app support large screen? What is their support? And what are the next steps to better support large screen? So we defined three tiers, which you can find in the page, um, which really help us talk about, like, Basic, better, and best is the nicknames we've given them of the, the different levels of support. And I'll go quickly into these. 
But before we get to those three tiers, there's kind of a sad place that goes before them, which is large screen restricted. And that when an app does no kind of support at all, we end up in this place where, as a system, we don't know what to do with the app. We're not sure we can stretch you to fill in the entire screen because we're not sure you're going to actually be able to behave correctly. And so we have to put a lot of apps into this compatibility mode that we call restricted. And this is a really, really sad place. Like, it's not a great user experience. It's not a great experience for you as a developer to know that your users are using this. Placer will warn users um, when installing an app on a larger screen that this will happen. And so hopefully no one in the room has an app that will actually fall into this category. Um, but let me go through common things that would put you into this category so that you're aware. The very first one is if you're declaring your app as non-resizable, by definition, we can't resize you. Right? And so that's a clear signal to us of, well, we know you're not going to support this, so you have to go into compatibility mode. Please don't do that. Another super common one is restricting the screen orientation. Apps that say they are portrait, well, it turns out most tablets out there are used in landscape. And so if you say that, surprise, we have to put you in compatibility mode. And then min and max aspect ratios. Think as well, we're talking about desktops, Chromebooks, uh, the era of free form windows. We want to be able to do all of that resizing. If we can't be sure we can do that, we'll end up in this state as well. Those are the three more kind of layout-related ones, but there's a couple more. Um, you want to think of app continuity and how you store state. For people who haven't seen a foldable device before, it's very common to kind of start using on the outside screen with a folded state. Say you start filling in a form, and halfway through, you open your device to finish. If the app loses all that state, that's a horrible user experience. And so we want to really make sure you're avoiding that, and you should be able to persist state across changes in screen size. And finally, we see quite a lot of camera compatibility issues, and we'll go into those a bit later. All of those things would put an app into large screen restricted, and we really, really want to avoid being in this place. Hopefully, that doesn't happen to any of you, and so we can move on to the real three tiers. And so, as I said before, we nicknamed them basic, better, and best. Let me go quickly through them. In basic, the main idea is your app does run on a large screen. You do fill up all the screen space that you're given, but it doesn't look nice. Right? Like it's usually we find a lot of blown up experiences, and so we really want to avoid being in the state. Um, use all of the guidance I mentioned earlier. We have a bunch of layout guidance. Think about the design so that you can get into the happier place, which is tier two. Tier two is what we consider apps that are really thinking about large screen and are making a good use of that space. Maybe it's multi-panel layouts. Maybe it's one of the canonical layouts I mentioned earlier. And also, you're starting to show some support for, say, input devices. Hopefully, this is the happy place. This is where we would love to see all apps reach, because okay? this is a good experience for the user. It's not a huge amount of work. And it gets us into that place where you really feel like you're using the space smartly. We do have a tier one, which is then the, the differentiated tier, right? Like hero experiences, if you go above and beyond and say you support stylus, you support um, folding devices can have postures, maybe you do something special for that, keyboard shortcuts, drag and drop, all of these things where an app shows that it goes above and beyond to support large screen, well, that would put you into tier one, and that is really kind of high level hero experiences, which means we will also be probably encouraged to feature those on the Play Store. They will have higher rankings because users are more interested in using these apps. We do have a dedicated talk that goes much deeper in the tiers, because I've just kind of glanced through it. Um, so please check out the specific talk on that if you want to know, uh, or check back the developer.android.com page I mentioned earlier that has all of the detail. Cool. With that, let's get into the practical tips that hopefully you can take away and start applying to your applications right away. Starting with reachability. As Clara mentioned, uh, most tablets or larger screen devices are often used in landscape. And so the way a user holds the device, interacts with the device, interacts with the UI of your application is going to be different than on a typical phone device. And that means some of the common placements of UI elements may be more difficult to reach, causing them to have to adjust their grip, take their hand off, just have less comfort using the experience generally. One example of this, and, and why we often show like the nav rail versus bottom nav bar example, is thinking about the navigation of your application. 
If we overlay the reachability chart, you can see some of the more center-focused navigational elements are pretty hard to reach, meaning that the user is probably going to need to take their hand off or adjust the way they're holding the device to actually reach those elements. And these are very commonly used things, like users are going to navigate around their app. It's going to be something they're going to do frequently. So when we recommend the nav rail, we're doing so because, hey, generally these are much more reachable. If I do need to adjust my grip to reach the higher to reach ones, I maybe need to move my hand slightly up rather than completely taking it off of the tablet to actually touch those navigational buttons. And this provides generally a better experience. While navigation is one example, you should think about the most used UI elements in your application and place them in the easy to reach areas. Um, Take a look at the next talk for more information about just general large screen design principles and philosophy so that you can build a great and uh, you can design and build a great UI experience for all devices and displays. Um, just to summarize, don't make UI elements really difficult to reach on these devices and do intentionally think about the design and placement of most accessed UI elements. The next issue that we've seen a lot with applications is exclusive hardware uh, access. In beginning in Android 12L and above, all applications will run in multi-window mode. And a lot of applications uh, assume, hey, if I'm portrait only, if I'm unresizable, I'm going to be the only application on, on the display at any given time, meaning I don't have to worry about this. That's no longer true. And so this is an example of applications handling it OK. You have two different camera applications. When you tap on one, it requests access to the camera. It actually uses it and the other one gracefully loses access to the camera without crashing. Many of the issues we saw were application crashes, so definitely make sure that you're handling exclusive hardware resources uh, gracefully. Um, the, the do here is check for access before actually using it. Fail gracefully if you do randomly lose access to it. Use Jetpack libraries if you can, because we will obfuscate much of this from you. So we will do the work so you don't have to. We know that doesn't solve all use cases, but if you can, we recommend Jetpack. And then last but not least, actually test this. Um, it can be so easily diagnosed using the, the resizable emulator or the desktop emulators. Place two applications side by side that are requesting access to the same exclusive hardware resource and see what happens when yours loses access, as an example. Uh, related to that, but a little bit different, is thinking about activity lifecycle events and how you handle them. Uh, again, this is about thoughtfulness and intentionality. Uh, a lot of what we saw, like, here's the example. I am watching a video app, and I want to take notes on the video. And maybe the video app on pause pauses all running content. So every time I try to take a note, the video that I was trying to watch to take notes on now pauses. That's a very frustrating and annoying user experience. In this example, we have the Photos app, which actually intentionally chose to pause because they assume, hey, I'm, I'm watching my own photos. It would be weird to pause my photo with, when using another app. Um, but when I browse, through Chrome, it pauses the video. Just think about these things. Think about how you want your application experience to behave when it's not the only application on the display. Um, instead, what you should be doing is removing uh, any, uh, uh, freeing up any appropriate resources in on stop, and just thinking about the end-to-end -end experience you want to provide when having multiple things on the display. The next one is probably the one I experience most commonly and the one I'm most passionate about, and I was already having a conversation with somebody here about this. Is tablet Boolean logic based off of arbitrarily identified display metrics? So what we're looking at here is a smallest width uh, qualified uh, resource file where you have an is tablet Boolean when the smallest dimension is 720 density independent pixels. I've seen everything from 600 to 720 to 800 to 840. Like people just pick arbitrary values. If you research this on Stack Overflow, there's some answer from 10 years ago with 800 upvotes. Um, it's not a great way to figure out how to adapt your uh, application experiences. And I actually have a story from one of our first party apps. We had this logic in one of our apps that basically gated access to an experience within an application to only phone devices. And so on a foldable device, you could enter into this application experience on the outer display. You could unfold the device, and that new display registered as a tablet. You could still use the experience because you were already navigated to it. But as soon as you left it, you couldn't get back to it. So you had to refold the device to get back into that experience if you wanted to use it again. It's just a terrible user experience. It's because of this type of logic. So please, please, please avoid arbitrary is device type logic. And I'll teach you on what to do instead. So if you're thinking about UI and layout related adaptivity, um, use window size classes. So these are our recommended breakpoints. They represent typical device usage patterns, but they are device agnostic. So if you're running in multi-window mode, if you're running in a freeform window, your UI and layouts will still adapt appropriately without having to think too much about this. 
If it's not a UI or, oh, sorry, before I jump into that, um, as previously mentioned as well, we now have a utility library called the Windows Size Class Library, uh, produced with com uh, the Compose Material 3 stable release that makes it super easy to use this in Compose. It's a single function call, you get observable layout breakpoint states, and you can adapt your layout as simple as that. It's one of my favorite new libraries. And if you're not thinking about UI and layout, and you're instead thinking about other things, we've seen people use is tablet logic to gate things related to telephony. And it's like, hey, like a tablet could actually support those scenarios. So why not? So, so actually look for what does my application experience depend on in the device? If that requirement or dependency is satisfied, enable it. Don't restrict it for, for no reason. Um, the next one is camera preview. Claire mentioned on this briefly. I'm actually not going to go into the solution for this, because we do have a dedicated talk. I'm just going to describe a little bit more about some of the problems that you may experience with camera applications, again, related to every application now runs in multi-window mode, and you can have very different kind of requirements or experiences as a result. And that comes down to alignment of different types of orientation. So every device has a natural orientation. Most phones, it's portrait. Most desktops, it's landscape. Some tablets, it can vary. But you have to align the display orientation with the natural orientation of the device with the sensor orientation. And these things can get out of alignment depending on the device your application is running on. You'll learn a lot more about how to solve that in the, the related talk. But one easy tip, use Camera X. Like I mentioned, if, we're, if you're using Jetpack libraries, we will do a lot of this for you. If you have requirements beyond what is supported in Camera X, you'll learn a lot more on how to fix these in the subsequent talk. Another common problem we see is related to insets. And we call insets the relationship between an edge-to-edge -edge app and the system UI. Think things like the notch, uh, gesture nav, or the new taskbar that was introduced in 12L. All of these things cause insets to change within your app, and you want to be able to handle those gracefully. When you don't handle these, uh, especially if you don't handle them dynamically, you can find that things like the new taskbar from 12L that comes from the bottom may include very important parts of your app. For example, if you're using bottom navigation and suddenly the taskbar comes up and you're not reacting to those insets, you're losing a huge part of functionality of your app. So you want to make sure that you are handling insets dynamically so that you can react and resize. To do that, we have the Window Insets Listener APIs. These provide you callbacks every time the insets change. So make sure you are using those instead of just assuming that the first value you get is what you'll get the entire runtime of the app. And make sure you're then updating. Say you're updating your margins to move content appropriately and fixing those. The next one we see a lot is apps that are clearly not tested on large screens. Um, for example, blown up layouts. Um, or we see a lot of broken behavior in multi-window. And all of these can be easily solved by using a bunch of the tools that we mentioned in the tools talk. Um, so I highly recommend, if you haven't seen that, you go back to the tools talk as a quick tip. Definitely use Resizable Emulator, because it allows you to test your app in different screen sizes really quickly. It allows you to test multi-window as well, like you can launch into multi-window and make sure that your app is behaving correctly. And use reference devices while you're developing, because it allows you really quickly to see how your app looks on different reference devices, which cover most of the ecosystem. Um, so highly recommend that. Otherwise, go look for the talk for more. And finally, to leave you with a good one, how many times have you assumed that all of your users are using touch? Well, that's not necessarily true. We have a huge fleet of Chromebook devices that can run your app. There will be a lot of users using keyboard or mouse or trackpad to interact with your app. Also, accessibility users may be interacting with your app with different accessibility devices. And so it's really important to make sure that you are supporting all of these inputs and not just assuming that people are going to touch your screen. For that, we have a dedicated talk that goes extremely in-depth on this, uh, the key to keyboard and mouse support across tablets and Chrome OS. Highly recommend if your app has any of these issues, you look into all of that detail. Um, but obviously, the, the do and don't is don't assume there's only touch input and support keyboard, mouse, and trackpad. OK, that was a lot of tips and information in 20 minutes. Um, I hope some of it sunk in. Uh, thank you so much. All right, so I think everyone's heard about canonical layouts now, um, but we're going to talk about them a little more. Um, I'm Liam Spradlin. I'm a senior design advocate on material design. Uh, and I wanted to uh, do this talk with Daniel to dive a little bit deeper, not only on the ideas and significance behind canonical layouts, but also how to implement them in a few different ways. 
Yes, and why should you care about this talk? So we briefly introduced the large screen quality tiers, and we mentioned that the best way to achieve tier two or, or some of the biggest issues we see with apps gating them from achieving tier two is related to UI and layout. And so the learnings from this talk will help you achieve that piece of, of the large screen quality guidelines for tier two so you can provide the best possible experience for your end users. Um, there's more detail in the three tiers of large screen quality on Google Play Talk if you want to learn more specifically about the tiers. But now let's get into the canonical layouts design philosophy. Sure. So as you heard in the last talk, the canonical layouts are based on what we know about a large sample of apps. Uh, we've developed three canonical layouts that seek to address a lot of the broad questions about how apps can and should adapt as you move between different screen types and sizes so that you can focus on the questions that are more specific to your product. We're going to dive into each of these layouts one by one and see what's going on inside each of them so that when you're making those decisions for your own app, you'll be doing so with an understanding of the layout's rationale and how all the pieces fit together. First, we have the list detail, which is, again, a parent-child relationship where you have two panes that are directly uh, in line in the navigation hierarchy with each other. Next, we have the supporting panel, where you have a primary and secondary pane that are not necessarily subsequent to each other in the navigation hierarchy, but both important and integral to one another. And then finally, we have the feed layout, where, where all of the panels are peers or siblings in the, in the hierarchy. And if you've had a chance to make yourself familiar with Material Design's large screen design guidance, then you're probably familiar with the idea of layout regions that kind of supersedes all of this. These are containers that form a framework for thinking about how interfaces scale across those different screens based on the ways most compositions end up breaking down based on behavior, content, and function. The first region is the navigation region. This contains navigation components like the navigation rail or the navigation drawer, and it helps users navigate between destinations inside an app or to access important actions. Second is the app bar region, which is also kind of self-explanatory. It's used to display and group components and actions that will help users perform key tasks or take action on elements inside. Number three, the body region, which displays most of the content in an app. So this is where you're going to find most of your components, like lists, cards, buttons, and images. Before we get into more details about each of the three individual canonical layouts, we're going to go through a lot of material that's going to vary in complexity. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is because everything we review is available here. So we're going to go, go into development guidance, including sample code and sample apps. All of those are public on GitHub. We basically tried to build the easiest way to implement each of these, so you can refer to those as a reference or a baseline for your own application. Um, additionally, everything is going to be grounded in Windows size class layout breakpoints. While we do have the new utility library for Compose, there are easy ways to implement Windows size class based logic in views layouts as well, and we'll review how to do some of that. And last but not least, before we get into the details, don't worry about the complexity on this slide yet. Um, it looks really complex, and the reason is because there are many existing ways to build UI and layout in Android. And we know, depending on how you built your app in the past, we've heard this time and time again from developers, that kind of dictates the easiest way for you to implement your large screen optimized layout in the future. And we want to make that choice easier for you. So really, only one of these green boxes is probably going to be applicable to each of your own applications, which simplifies the complexity a lot. But this flowchart will help get you, get you there. And we'll go through each of these in step-by-step -step details. So back to the list detail canonical layout. Here's an example. What can we see going on here? Um, in this example, we're dealing primarily with a body region that I mentioned before. And it allocates a variable number of columns in the layout between the list and detail subregions or panels. And I say variable because as you continue to adapt to larger screens, the two panels may become asymmetric. The main things to remember with the list detail layout, as with many layouts, are the relationships between the primary regions in the layout and the visual hierarchy that allows people using your app to more quickly complete a mental model that helps them understand how it works. For list detail, the relationship between our two panels is pretty simple. Um, the detail is at the deepest level of the navigation hierarchy, and it's subordinate to the list. In this arrangement, the user is straightforwardly navigating one level deep from the list into the detail. This is even true for more complicated list detail layouts, like we see here in the reply email app. It adds a navigation region, which is at the top level of the hierarchy and, and affects the entire content region, with the capability to access several different list detail screens or even full body features like video calling. 
In terms of how a user builds their mental model from this, the list detail guides users directionally from the navigation to the list and finally to the detail. And it traverses that same visual hierarchy in a visual sense as well, because the detail, which is in this case an email thread, is the primary focus of the screen. It's the most dynamic task. It's elevated at a higher level than the list of emails, which is in turn elevated at a higher level than the navigation region, which appears to rest on the background. In this way, the hierarchy is made clear not only by directionality of the layout, but also by visual treatments. And from there, the normal markers of emphasis and action, like type styles and button containment, apply within each discrete thread or message. So this is probably the most common example of the canonical layouts that we see in practice. A lot of applications have a cha parent-child content relationship. So let's figure out how you can build it. Um, so trying to simplify this flowchart already, really there's a couple of decisions you'll need to consider when building a list detail layout. And we're going to go through two of the three right now. Um, we're going to skip over Compose for list detail, because we're going to review it in Supporting Panel. And conceptually, they're very similar. But starting with, if you have UI content spread across multiple activities within your application, we now have a solution for you to easily implement a list detail optimized layout called Activity Embedding. What is Activity Embedding? Activity Embedding is a new platform feature supported on devices running Android 12L and later that lets you display UI content for multiple activities from your own application within a single task with just configuration. It's very easy to implement. It's kind of the, the shortcut to a list of detail layout, if you will, if you're using multiple activities. Um, and let's take a look. So this is pretty much most of what you would need to do to implement activity embedding within an existing application. It's primarily configuration driven, meaning you just add a new XML configuration file to your application, and then you register that rule at runtime with like a single line of code. Uh, we'll go into more detail in a later talk. Um, but basically, what you'll do is you'll define a placeholder rule, and you'll create a placeholder activity. This will be like the default navigation the first time a user opens the application. What should you show in the detail pane? And then you can configure your primary and secondary activity split configuration in the split pair rule, including the ratio, so how much of the, con or the display should be given to the primary activity versus the secondary activity. When should I actually show this split? So what is the min width? In this case, we're picking the medium width device category of 600 dp. And what's really great about activity embedding as well is with Jetpack library support, you can implement it in your existing application with down-level support. So you don't have to like fork your application to only support this. And the behavior is going to be unchanged on devices that don't support activity embedding or on devices that don't meet the split min width uh, value. So basically, you're only improving the experience on large screens without touching the experience on all other devices. It's, it's a really simple, easy way to get a better experience for list detail applications. You'll learn more about this in the Do More with Multi-Window and Activity Embedding talk. Next is, we're going to skip over the Compose, like I mentioned, uh, a views-based solution. Say you're using multiple fragments called Sliding Pane Layout. This is a Jetpack library that lets you embed multiple fragments side by side. And we've done a lot of the work for you to basically create a more dynamic and adaptive experience. So similarly, once your application doesn't meet the width criteria based off of the width of each of the two fragments, uh, we will go back to the single pane view versus the two pane view in a sliding pane layout. In addition, recent updates to the library now will take it uh, into consideration a physical hinge. So if the device has a physical hinge splitting the displays, it will split the content over that so you don't have to worry about that. It does all that for you. It's a, another really great way to build a, a simple list detail layout with little effort. Uh, to use it, you basically have your two fragments. In this case, we have a recycler view with a list of elements that is contained on the left. And then we have the details contained on the right. And those are just the two child elements to the sliding pane layout. Uh, layout in general. OK, moving on to the supporting panel layout. As you can probably tell from the name and from this example screen, this layout also relies on a primary and secondary panel. But compared to the list detail, you'll immediately notice that the directionality of the layout has changed. Here, the primary focus panel, which is still at the highest elevation, is more towards the center of the layout because the supporting panel doesn't necessarily exist outside the context of the primary panel. The primary and secondary focal points are considered equally important and contain different content. Um, and both panels can scroll independently of one another. Like before, the panels share space inside the body region of the layout using a variable number of columns. But generally, the primary panel is going to use more space. In terms of information hierarchy, the supporting panel is secondary and still complementary to the primary. Um, 
Because of the relationship between these panels, the supporting panel can also appear at different points on the screen. So here we see an example on a taller screen where it uses the supporting panel to show comments on a doc. The comments are providing useful context to the doc, but in terms of the information hierarchy of the screen, they're still secondary to the content of the doc itself. So just to summarize, if you have a primary secondary content relationship within your UI and layouts, supporting panel is a great large screen optimized layout choice for you. And let's learn how to build it. So this time we will go into Compose. We're not going to explore all of the Compose concepts here, just the adaptive layout piece. You'll learn more about Compose in a later talk. Um, but we have a new two-pane composable in our accompanist library that makes this much easier for you. So what you can do with a supporting panel layout, if you wanted to configure your own, is use this new two-pane composable to basically determine your display or presentation strategy. So in a compact width case, again, I'm using that new Windows size class utility library here, I can basically split the content vertically, 50-50 in this case. And in a medium width case, oops, sorry, there you can see the, the second composable. In a medium width case, I can split it horizontally 50-50, and I've got my main and supporting content. And we'll go into a lot more detail on this one in a later talk on Compose, implementing responsive UI for larger screens. And there's another talk as well about navigation in Compose to figure out the best way to adapt your navigation model for these types of layouts. Another option for building a great supporting panel UI is using resource qualified layouts with a number of existing views-based layout APIs. Uh, so for example, we'll use a linear layout API in this example, where we have our activity main XML file that is not resource qualified. This would be the default layout that is inflated on a device that is basically going to use a vertical orientation for this linear layout to again split the content top to bottom. And we'll basically set the weight equally so that it'll be a 50-50 split. And you could adjust this for your own app needs. And then when we go into a medium width layout, note, note the resource qualifier here. It is not smallest width. It is width. That's intentional. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. But in this case, I would split the content horizontally. And again, I can do a 50-50 split on like a typical foldable inner display. Going back to this statement from before, because I'm really passionate about it, don't do is tablet like Boolean logic. And the reason why we don't want you to use smallest width-based logic is thinking about freeform windowing cases. So on a Chrome OS device, when you reduce the height of an application window, it's really weird to then reduce the amount of usable horizontal space in the application. So if I use smallest width and I have a two-pane layout and I shrink the height of my window and then I lose the two-pane layout to a one-pane layout, that's a really unexpected and unusual user experience. If you're using just width as your resource qualifier, then when you shrink the width of the application window, you might lose that secondary pane, and that is much more intuitive than, than the alternative. So again, don't use this. Uh, for those on the live stream, check out this optimizing apps for large screen. Susan Don't Stalk for more on why not to use this tablet. Um, going back into that, so now the expanded width layout, so we're using 840 dp as our width-based layout qualifier. And the only thing we're changing here is the layout weight. So it's really just two lines of code. The one disadvantage, and we hear this from developers with resource qualifiers, is you now have the same UI elements split across multiple files. And so the one word of caution, as well as reminder, is if you're making updates or changes to your UI and layouts that are resource qualified, don't forget to make them in all resource qualified versions of those layouts. Um, it creates a little bit of extra maintenance cost, but the delta between each of the different files is so small, it's generally not that hard for, to, to do the upkeep and to keep them maintained. OK, finally, we have the feed. Um, and from the name and its prevalence across products, I bet you can already guess a lot of the details. Um, a feed is a grid layout that's composed of a lot of distinct but related items that are all on the same level as each other in both the visual and navigational hierarchy. Um, here, instead of just a horizontal directionality for our app layout, we have the horizontal flavor of the layout regions with the navigation and body regions with a vertically scrolling grid structure. And since all items in the feed have similar elevation treatment, emphasis among them ends up coming from things like size, type treatments, and color. Here, navigation can access multiple different feed layouts, while items in a feed are all providing entry points to content deeper in the app. With a feed layout, you could conceivably allow the user to enter a list detail by selecting a story, but you can just as easily provide an immersive experience by giving body region entirely to that story. Because of the grid-based layout, um, it's one of the most straightforward in terms of the division of space. By using the entire body region for the grid, it scales really easily to larger screens. 
just to recap, a feed layout is a great choice if you have content of equal weight or equal relationships, where maybe you want to highlight one or the other, but generally they're of equal importance. And as Liam mentioned, this is one of the easier things to think about from like an adaptive concept point of view. If you're using Views or Compose, you're going to use respective grid-based controls. And you're going to change the number of columns, basically, the number of layout columns to fit more or less content on the screen, depending on what's available. So let's take a look at that in action, starting with Compose using lazy grid controls. So in this case, we have a custom feed composable that was authored, which is basically a fancy wrapper around a lazy vertical grid control. And what I'm doing to that is adding some own, my own custom column logic, again, using window size class. So my actual suites feed uh, composable, which is the one that you see rendered on the right, is going to pass in uh, a window size class value and then call a utility function in the application to figure out the number of columns to display based off of the available space. So in this case, in a compact width environment, like a typical phone, it's going to be a grid with one column or a kind of a list of cards, if you will. It's a very similar layout. If it's medium width, it'll be a grid with two columns. And then if it's expanded, it'll be a dynamic grid that will do the number of columns that so long as each grid column can have at least 240 dp width. So the number of grids will grow or shrink. And Compose APIs make that really, really easy to do. This is what it would look like in practice uh, using the resizable emulator. So if you want to try it out, um, you can easily test it at runtime and make sure that the adaptive logic is working as expected. Taking a look at views, you're going to use uh, Recycler View as your base controller. But then you're going to basically change the layout adapter based off of the available display space. So in this case, we're going to inflate that feed-based layout, and we're going to do some logic to figure out how many columns to use. This is the most naive and simple implementation of this. If you don't need the, the, the best solution, this is better than not doing anything at all. You can, again, use resource qualified values to determine a static number of columns. So in this case, compact is one, medium is two, and expanded would be a fixed five. You could use Jetpack Window Manager APIs to get display metrics and change this in code if you want to get more complex and advanced. Um, it's not that hard to do, but the samples that we publish are the easiest possible ways to achieve each of these layouts, and this is really the easiest way to do it. And then based off of those values, you'll pass in the number of columns to uh, your layout manager, and we'll change to either a linear layout manager or a grid layout manager if you have more than one column. And it will result in this type of layout. So you can see in this case, I will always have five grid, uh, columns and an expanded width layout. The size of the columns will vary based off of the display uh, size, but it will always be five. Uh, with that, we hope you take a look at the resources, take a look at the samples, and can use them to build these layouts in your own applications. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex, a developer relations engineer. And I'm Matvey, a software engineer working on Jetpack Compose. So today, we are going to take a look at how Compose can help you build uh, adaptive UI on all your apps, no matter the orientation, device you're running on, or the window real estate available. We'll learn what considerations to keep in mind uh, when building apps at each layer. Speaking of layers, today we are going to zoom in bit by bit. We'll start from the application level, which is the outermost level for your UI. Then we'll go to the screen level, which is like still you get the majority of the window, but you arrange items and components uh, based on the window size available. And then we are going to take a look at the components and how the choice of components can help you have an adaptive UI by default. Um, let's start from the application level. In this level, you basically have your window to render your whole UI into. Um, the thing about this window is that this window has obviously a size, height, and width. And this width and height, they can change dynamically. And it will change as your app is running. And you have to keep these considerations in mind. Let's start first to see like, what we should do and what we should not do uh, with this knowledge that the window size can change. Let's start from breaking the rigid assumptions of having is phone or is tablet uh, booleans in your application. Going to the extreme, you can have completely different UIs, files, code structures, navigation patterns that can result in bug fix uh, in the bugs. And bug fix is hard. You have to maintain the whole separate like, structures and files. And most importantly, this doesn't represent the patterns like the, how the users use our UI these days, uh, our applications these days on the all devices available. For example, those are the patterns we should avoid. And this is, uh, for example, uh, the tablet in which users have decided to put our application, decided to put our application uh, based uh, um, side by side with another one. 
This results that uh, in our app having a window size which is way closer to the phone than to the whole tablet available. So it's way more practical to work with the window size and not with the device size or something like this. Thankfully in Compose, we can uh, use it with ease. We can just treat our window size as an input to our composable. Because of the nature of Compose, when the window size changes, the, com the composables are composed, and you can make some UI-based UI decisions based on this uh, window size. As you might have heard, uh, we took it a bit further and made it a library, which we call material 3 window size class uh, This library provides you with useful methods like calculate window size class. This method takes the numerical size of your window using the Jetpack Window Manager APIs, and convert it to what we call a window size classes, which is a set of our predefined uh, width and height breakpoints, uh, which represent the majority of devices or window sizes in a particular category. For example, uh, compact window size width of the window can represent the majority of the phones, but also if you place the application side by side with another tablet, you also get the, window, uh, the compact window width size class. So taking this library, we can use it in Compose just like this. We take it as, a, as an input to our composable, and then we make UI-based decisions. Because we're talking about the application level, the, up, the UI we should be concerned about is mostly navigation. So what we recommend is that we recommend to use bottom navigation for the compact window size classes, and then we recommend to use um, navigation rail for the rest, meaning the medium and expanded window width size classes. Uh, we have this talk called uh, Navigation Compose on Every Side Screen by Jeremy that goes more into the details of how to handle uh, all the bits and pieces of navigation in your application, given the large screens. All right, now let's zoom in a step to take a look at the level of a screen. Your app probably has many screens, each with a recognizable set of UI to provide some functionality to the user. You might have a home screen, a search screen, a settings screen. These are each going to look differently from each other. So what's a generic framework that we can use to co construct a screen that is going to be shown across these various devices and window sizes? Well, when you're creating a screen, you're building a logic, or sorry, you're building a screen that's rendering UI as a counterpart for the logic for that screen. So from a state holder, you'll get the state, a uh, list of information, loading information, error states, and you'll also pass back events to the state holder representing user actions. With both of these two things, you can create a bunch of basic UI uh, that you can display. These will be your basic composable functions, things like text, buttons, and checkboxes. Components can also be combined into other components. You might have a reusable list item, a reusable card item, and you might be displaying multiple of the same type of component to display a list. All right, so we have the state we want to display. We know what the user can do on the screen, and we also have all the individual pieces of UI we want to show. But we're still missing one thing, and that's the screen itself. What you need to do is lay out all these components together, and you should use the window size class as an additional input into this decision. So at a compact width, we can render all of our components vertically in a column one by one. But at an expanded width, we could use those same components, but use an alternate arrangement that makes better use of the screen space available. So here we have now a single screen that's rendering adaptive UI. Same data, same actions, but alternate layouts. This is the primary role of this screen level composable, managing the arrangement of components with the same data and actions where that arrangement is partially based on the window size. All right, with this in mind, let's take a look at a simple onboarding example. Here we have an image of my cat, some contextual information, and a button to continue on to the rest of the screen. The logic for the screen is super straightforward. On all devices and window sizes, you should be able to see the info and then continue on to the next screen. So let's see what happens when we run a larger screen. Oh no, the button is completely cut off here, and it's impossible to continue on to the rest of the app. So we can clearly do a better job here, both to make it be functional and also use the window size to choose a better overall layout. So let's start with the current code, with the column of the image, the text, and the button. The very first thing we can do to fix that show-stopping bug where we couldn't even continue on to the rest of the app is to make the column scrollable. So this will work, but it will not be quite as good as we can do. We can do better. So the main issue here is that our image is filling up the entire width of the window. Uh, this sort of worked if you're in portrait, where the height is much taller than you are wide. Um, but as the aspect ratio changes closer and closer to the landscape, that starts to break down. Instead, what we can do is apply a weight to the image inside the column. This allows the image to resize and ensures that the button is always going to be visible without having to scroll. 
All right, one more thing we can do, though, is when we're at an expanded window width, we now have enough space that we can rearrange the components to make better use of the screen space available. So at an expanded width, we can instead display the image side by side in a row instead of in a column. So putting all these things together, we now have a UI that is both functional and looks good across window sizes. And as the window size changes, the screen will adapt its layout to ensure all content is displayed. OK. Uh, now let's take a look at the little bit more complicated examples using kind of the same framework. Uh, these examples involve um, companies that move in relation to each other and the window itself. And the arrangement changes as the window size changes. We identified these three patterns, which we call feed, uh, supporting panel, and list detail, which are the most common throughout the whole um, variety of apps you can, um, you can build. We call them canonical layouts, as you might have heard before. Uh, we treat them as canonical layouts because they are our opinionated way on how you can arrange components on a screen and how you can change this arrangement based uh, on the window size that is changing as well. Let's go through them one by one to learn more. So feed uh, is the um, amazing canonical layout that, that uh, displays the set of items with roughly equal importance. You can see on the mock here, we have kind of like a staggered grid, which is also the API available in Compose 1.3 as experimental. Uh, the real-life example of this might look like uh, the following. Uh, the video is running. The video is running. So on the video, uh, you could see how, thank you, uh, how, how um, the now in Android app is being resized and we switch from lazy column, uh, single column composable, to a staggered grid. And as more as I resize, uh, resize the window, the more uh, cards join the horizontal uh, row while still being scrollable. This is basically the staggered grid as well we're using from Compose. Uh, also here, you should be able to see the power of the freeform emulator, which uh, allows you to test uh, to test your UI uh, while the window is dynamically changing, which is very, very useful. So just to recap quickly, the feed is very useful when you have a set of items. Uh, it can be used for videos, cards, images, and so on. We have some APIs available. Lazy Vertical Grid is a stable API available in Compose to use this, or Lazy Vertical Stagger Grid if you are feeling a little bit more experimental, which is an experimental API available in 1.3. In this example, uh, with now in Android, I use adaptive grid strategy, which allows you to basically get the, um, the resizing um, more cards joining your uh, width of your window as you resize for free by using uh, adaptive arrangement, both on just grid and a staggered grid as well. OK, on to the next one, which is a supporting panel. Supporting panel uh, gives, you, um, gives the majority of the content to the main. Uh, portion, which is kind of content in focus, and then the rest, which is a supporting panel, which is a su supporting uh, part of the, of the window. Remember this uh, video cards example we just built a few minutes ago? Well, this is basically a uh, supporting panel which uh, we can build using Compose if you have the right tools. Let's find out these tools. Um, first of all, we calculate the window size classes, as before. The important thing to note here is that even though we introduced window size classes at the application level, they are still useful at the screen level as well. Why? Because at the screen level, you still get the majority of the window. And so it makes sense to make some um, distinctions based on this data. So we calculate our window size class. And we also calculate a display, a display features, which is the object containing um, uh, information about folds and hinges to better support foldables. This calculate display features is our API available in a company's library. A company's library is our laboratory-like um, library available on GitHub, contains some useful bits and pieces that are not yet in Compose. Go check it out. Uh, try these building blocks we'll see uh, right now and later on, on in the stock. Let us know what you think, file issues, and go check the second link, which is FAQ, that explains why a company exists and why you might use them. So we're taking this display, uh, the window size class and display features from our companies, and we build in our supporting panel. Uh, first of all, you can see the two pane, which is uh, the building block also in our companies, uh, companies.adaptive, which is like the whole set of um, adaptive building blocks. So you take this uh, building block, it allows you to arrange two pieces of content, either vertically or horizontally, and it also supports foldables, uh, as, we, as, we can see, uh, as we can see later. So this is amazing building block for supporting panel. We take this two pane, we pass our first slot as a video, the main content, and then we uh, leave the second, content for the second slot for the list. Now, the most juicy bit. 
uh, we pass a strategy, and we pass a strategy based on the window size class available. So, for example, we might, dis uh, might decide that it makes sense for us on a compact um, window width to show them one by one vertically, and then ar arrange them horizontally on the medium set class. Uh, we can also realize that, for example, for the expanded uh, window width, we have more real estate available, and we can give a little bit more to the video. So that's, that's where you can see like 0, 7 for the expanded one. Uh, last but not least, display features, remember? I told you about this. Um, so on this amazing, amazing photo, you can see the tabletop uh, mode on a foldable. It's basically a foldable that is folded 90 degrees. Uh, and uh, passing display features will make sure that 2Pane respects this well. So if your user decides to put like 90 degrees, uh, your foldable 90 degrees, the 2Pane will arrange them 50-50, so uh, both of the panes are accessible uh, properly. So, to a little bit recap, supporting panel is a very versatile canonical layout, to be honest. Uh, as long as you have any main content and any part of supporting content, uh, you can use this um, canonical layout to support better large screens. Uh, two pane is here to help. Uh, it can support vertically, horizontal, split. You can tweak the values as your use case fit. And you can specify like, what folds to support, what hinges to support, and what orientation. So, pretty, pretty flexible. Right. The last one is list detail. Uh, the list detail is the canonical layout which allows you to set uh, to show either list, the selected item from this list, which is a detail, or both. Because we are talking here uh, a hierarchical UI where you can have a list and detail, and basically detail uh, depends on the item selected in the list, the navigation uh, part might present some challenges for, uh, for this canonical layout. Uh, please go check the talk, Navigation Compost on large screens. It's uh, thoroughly covered there how to handle the back stack and all this navigation story there. On the UI part, we can use two pane again, because basically you can show the two panes on a list and detail. So uh, this is amazing building block for our list, de list detail as well. And a bit of recommendation from our side, we recommend to use only list or only detail on a uh, compact and medium with size classes, and show both on the expanded one, as you have more real estate. Uh, the, the sample for the supporting panel, and for the list detail, and for the feed, are available on this link. This is the um, repo of our samples we host on GitHub. Go check it out. Try it in your application. Let us know what you think. And then hopefully, those samples should allow you to get to the happy large screen place better and faster. All right. So we've looked at an app, uh, the app level. We've looked at the screen level. Let's zoom in one more time now to talk about individual components. Uh, individual components should also be flexible and work across a different range of sizes and using the correct building blocks to do so. Uh, components that are flexible will help with optimizing for larger screens, but they will also help to alternate amounts of space due to different languages, different font size, different data, or any combination of the above. These more flexible components are also more reusable, because it means you can plug them into different areas more easily without running into issues. So let's first take a look at an inflexible component. So as you can see here with these cards, if there's not enough space, or if the font size has been increased, the chips at the bottom might be cut off which isn't great. So let's take a look at how we can fix that. We'll start with our overall code for the card, which has a column of the header, the title, and the body, and then the chips at the bottom. And we know those chips aren't very scaling very well. So let's take a cl closer look at those. Right now, we're displaying the chips in a basic row. So this seemed to work if we only had one or two chips and if we had enough space. But as you can see, if we have more chips or not enough space, this starts to break down. We can fix this by using a more appropriate component for the job. Flow row is another component from Accompanist that allows us to do so. Flow row will break the chips onto an additional line if possible, or if needed, uh, to display all the chips without being clipped. So as you can see here, now all five chips are displayed um, across two rows. So going back to the cards, we can now see that the chips are no longer cut off, even on the different screen sizes and font sizes. Setting up a set of previews like this is super helpful um, to verify your behavior as you're making changes uh, and to test across different amounts of these configurations. Um, and also, if you want to apply these configurations to multiple composables, uh, be sure to create a multi-preview annotation as well. One other thing to keep in mind at the component level is that devices with larger screens also mean different input devices being used to interact with your app. So if you're using a mouse, things like hover states and mouse clicks are important. Uh, composables, uh, components from composables handle these interactions automatically. 
Um, so things like uh, the simple interactions automatically. So things like if you're using modifier.clickable or indication, you should get some of these basic support um, out of the box. But there's a lot more that you can do here to make full use of the flexibility that these different, different input devices provide. So be sure to check out the other ADS talks on keyboard, mouse, and stylus. All right, so we're going to zoom back out now. Think about how you can make each level of your app more responsive. If individual components can be intelligently displayed across a large number of configurations while making less assumptions, they're going to be more reusable and robust to different combinations of size, locale, and other factors. These reusable components are also easier to organize in different ways, using the screen space available to structure a screen that still provides some functionality to a user. And at the app level, you can see the benefits of separating state from UI. You have a single app and navigation structure that's representing the same data and features to a user, but it's optimized to be even more useful on their device. Thank you very much, and as always, happy composing. Hey, everyone. Oh, hey, Sarah. Hey, Francesco. Oh, good. Did you have the chance to see my latest camera app? No, I haven't seen it yet, but I hope you tested it on a tablet. Of course, it's the form factor day. <laughs> look, look how gorgeous it looks on a tablet. Oh, wow, it looks great. Wait, but what if I want to rotate the tablet? She wants to rotate the tablet. Why? Well, for many reasons. Maybe for a different angle, for better ergonomics, things like that. I mean, I, can, I guess we can give it a try. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of unexpected, I would say. You know, I, I locked the orientation uh, for the activity in the manifest, so I was expecting the preview will look like OK ish. Yeah, well, that might be OK for you still on Android 11, but don't you know now that the OEM can override um, the, the chance to lock the orientation? Yeah, I kind of heard about it. but. Yeah, I thought it would look OK in any case. Yeah, let me quickly explain what's happening here. You might think it's as simple as just rotating the, the image, but there's actually three types of orientation you have to think about now. Three types of orientation. OK, go ahead. I'm listening. Let's start with the basics. Do you know what natural orientation is? Uh, yeah, I heard. Please go on. Yep. So natural orientation is the orientation that a user will naturally use a device in. So you can imagine it's something like landscape for a laptop or portrait for a phone. For a tablet, it could be either of these two. So starting from this, we can then define two other major concepts. So next, camera orientation is the angle between the camera sensor and the natural orientation of the device. This is likely dependent on how the camera is physically mounted on the device, um, and it is always supposed to be aligned with the long, long side of the screen. OK, it is always supposed to be aligned with the longest side of the screen. I have a question. What's the longest side of the screen for a foldable device as it can physically transform into geometry? That is a great question. <laughs> Let's check out the next example. So as you noted, a foldable can have a portrait-shaped window if it's folded and a landscape-shaped window if it's unfolded. For this very reason, starting in API 32 and beyond, this field is no longer static, and instead you should retrieve it dynamically through the camera characteristics object. OK, if it's not static. Okay. But that means that the same physical camera can have two different orientations depending on the screen you're using it? Yes, exactly. So if you look at the picture here, you can see what can happen if you assume that the camera orientation always stays the same. It can cause mismatch between the camera orientation and the device's natural orientation, which can lead to distortion. OK, I guess that means I should never cache this value. Yep, and not just for new form factors. In general, you should not store it and instead retrieve it dynamically um, anytime you need it by calling this code. OK, noted. Now what? So next, we need to take into account the device rotation. This measures how much the device is physically rotated from its natural orientation. How much the device is physically rotated from its natural orientation? Is it like degrees or what? So basically, you'll get an integer between 0 and 4 by calling display.getRotation. And then you can convert it to degrees by multiplying the result by 90. And then the result will be consistent with the sensor orientation that we just discussed. OK. Well, I guess I can deal with that. But just for the preview, we have been looking at the device geometry, uh, the camera characteristics, and uh, data from the display stack. Is there anything else I need to know? Nope, this is pretty much everything. The actual math is pretty simple. Let's take a look at the code. 
So here we can see a code snippet that computes the rotation required in degrees to transform the sensor output orientation to the device's current orientation. The rotation needs to be either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on if the camera is facing the front or back of the screen. And then we basically just calculate the difference between the two concepts we just discussed, um, with a little bit of math to make sure that the value is always between three, 0 and 360 degrees. OK. Uh, now I see why my app was sideways. You know, having a look at the orientation in the portrait, I thought that like, I was assuming I could avoid dealing with all of that. But you know, let's get back to my app and try to apply this algorithm. So this tablet has a natural orientation portrait. That means the sensor orientation is 90 degrees. But I just rotated it, and now the display rotation is 90 degrees too. If I'm still good at math, it's just 90 minus 19. So the right rotation to be applied is 0. Yep, that's correct. But then why are you applying 90? Well, I haven't applied any rotation. I just used the default values. That explains the issue. By default, text review will take into account the sensor orientation, but not the display rotation. OK. Now I see why for the portrait mode, I didn't need to do that much. OK. Let me fix it, run it again, pretending it's compiling. Go ahead. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. Wow. Can I ask you another favor, though? Another favor she wants to ask. Um, OK. Go on. So the tablet has a lot of screen space. Mm -hmm. Can you quickly throw up maps and split screen? It shouldn't be an issue, right? It shouldn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> OK, let's try. So we have the taskbar. We grab maps. And uh, what, what happened? Uh, OK, I see why you asked this favor. So I guess there's a lesson to learn. So please, go on. Yep. So handling the orientation alone does not guarantee a correct camera preview. For example, in multi-window mode here, you might need to display a landscape-shaped camera output into a portrait-shaped window. And as we see here, without the right transformation, you might end up with a display that's distorted or shrunken. Um, so you'll either need to crop the image like this or scale it to match the aspect ratio, depending on your use case, like this. OK. Uh, that totally makes sense, but how do I do that? So we have a manual solution for camera two. It might take a little bit too long to explain here, but I will leave the link here for your reference. I really suggest, though, that unless you need to use the Surface directly, you, use, you take advantage of the libraries that we've built for you to help in this task. Sure, libraries like Camera X? Exactly. Jetpack Camera X can be the right solution because it automatically transforms the preview for every screen size um, and handles the camera lifecycle through different configuration changes um, or through multi-resource access. So Camera X also release, releases are continuous, um, and it's continuously updated and tested on different devices, so you'll ensure the best compatibility. OK, that sounds amazing. The only thing is, I'm already using all those Camera 2 APIs, and I haven't migrated yet to Camera X. Is there a solution for me? Yep, no worries. We do have something for Camera 2. So we just released a new artifact that does not depend on Camera X core. It's called Camera Viewfinder, and you can basically substitute your raw surface directly with it and let the library handle all of the nuances for you. That sounds perfect, but how come I didn't know about it? Because we just released it today. Woo! Yay! <laughs> you can check out how to use it at the link here. OK, wonderful. OK, let me just look at the code right now. OK, so I see at the beginning, we choose the resolution we want for the preview as usual. And then we build this request. And then we get this callback. And when the surface is available, if everything went well, we can just use that surface with the standard camera to APIs, as always, instead of you know getting the surface from the texture view, the surface view, applying the rotation. And that's it. Yep, that's it. Camera viewfinder will take care of all the orientation and aspect ratio considerations for you. Amazing. Well, I guess I don't have excuses anymore. I need to go update my app. Good luck. Hopefully, the resources we talked about today will be helpful for you. And I hope all of you are also encouraged to test your camera apps on different devices and form factors. Thanks for your time today, and have fun with your camera apps. And now it's time for a coffee break, everybody, um, which lasts 20 minutes. So back in the room at 2.50. Thank you. Back in the room at 2.50. Thanks, everyone. Hi, 
I'm Ben, a developer relations engineer at Google, and today I'd like to talk to you about drag and drop for seamless multitasking. On large screen devices, we've seen an increase in side by side app usage. For example, Chrome multi instance usage is 42% greater on tablets and foldables than on phones. As a result of this trend, investing in drag and drop is a great way to reduce friction for users on large screen devices. With it, users can share content between apps with one seamless gesture instead of by navigating each app's specific menus. Though you can do the full drag and drop integration yourself, the Jetpack Core and drag and drop libraries make it much easier to implement, both on the sending side and on the receiving side. Let's take a look at what it's like to use them. To begin with, Drag Start Helper is a utility class from the Android X Core library that handles detecting gestures commonly used to start a drag, such as long pressing on a touchscreen or clicking and dragging with the mouse. To wire things up for you, it takes a view and an on drag start listener as parameters. The on drag start listener you provide will be called when a drag gesture has been detected. In it, you should create a clip data that represents the information to be shared via the interaction. The best practice is to include multiple representations of the information in one clip data. For example, when dragging an image, you can include a high quality PNG, a lower quality JPEG, and a URL to the hosted version of the image. This way, more drop destinations are supported, and those that support multiple formats can choose which one is most suitable. To make it clear to the user what is being dragged, you can easily set and customize the appearance of the dragged object by implementing a drag shadow builder. Here, we are using the default one, which returns a shadow that has the same appearance as the view itself. Finally, to tell the system to start sending drag events, call the view's start drag and drop method. The system will take care of communicating with available drop targets. An important thing to note here is the two flags we're using when calling start drag and drop. Drag flag global is used to indicate the drag events should be sent to apps other than the source app, and is critical to a great multitasking experience. Additionally, since the content being shared is a resource accessible by your content provider, and not just plain text, Drag flag global URI read is used to give other apps permission to read from the content provider. There are additional flags you can use to modify the behavior, so be sure to check out the documentation. One more thing, don't forget to call drop helper's attach method so everything actually gets set up. The counterpart on the drop side is drop helper, a utility class from the Android X drag and drop library that takes care of setting up drop targets. When configuring your drop target, you include a list of content types that your target supports. In this snippet, the target supports plain text and all image types. The drop helper will use this to handle highlighting your view when a suitable drag event is detected above the target. To further configure your drop target, you can supply some options, such as the highlight color and border radius. If your target contains any edit text and you do not want them to take precedence over the target itself, you should use add inner edit text to handle this behavior for you. Finally, you provide an on-receive content listener implementation that is called with a drop payload when the user releases the content onto the target. This listener provides a uniform interface that can also be used for paste events and keyboard image input. And with that, you've got everything you need to start dragging and dropping into and out of your app. Lastly, the drag start helper and drop helper I primarily focused on views. Built-in compose support is on the roadmap to make this easier there as well. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more, please check out the resources linked below. I'm Jessica Dene Early Cha, an Android Developer Relations Engineer, and welcome to learning about the three tiers of large screen quality on Google Play. With more than a quarter billion large screen Android devices today, it's more important now than ever to ensure your application runs well on large screens. Starting with Android 12L, Feature Drop, and building onto it with Android 13, Android makes it easier to multitask and interact with your app in ways beyond the traditional portrait-oriented phone experience we're all too familiar with. And the work you do will also have an effect on the Play Store listing. In Play homepages, we'll now be featuring and promoting high-quality large screen apps. Android users will also see ratings and reviews specific to the form factors that they're browsing for. For example, tablet users will see apps, ratings, and reviews submitted by other tablet users to better identify apps that work well on the device they're using. To learn more about these changes in Google Play, specific to large screens and form factors, take a look at Allison's talk. Make your app shine for all devices in Google Play.
In this talk, though, we'll be exploring how Google's providing actionable and practical guidance to make it easier for you to improve your app for large screens and to take advantage of the large and growing user base. To make things actionable and easy to follow for developers, we've broken our large screen quality guidance into three tiers. Tier three is basic support. Your app will be full screen and fully usable on all display sizes. Your app UI and layout can look like a blown up version of your phone UI, but everything's functional. Tier two is better support. You've provided an optimized app UX for all screen sizes, meaning the large screen specific UI and layouts. We recommend that all apps hit tier two large screen support to provide great experience for users. Tier one is the best support. At this point, your app is differentiated on large screen devices. You take full advantage of the form factors to enable new scenarios that might not be possible on traditional phones. It is also possible to not achieve any of these tiers and can be a large screen restricted app. If your app is large screen restricted, it has functional or usability issues, or it runs in the runtime compact mode. Let's jump into each of these tiers from worst to best, starting with the large screen restricted. If your app is large screen restricted, it has issues impacting usability on large screens. One example of this is your app crashes unexpectedly due to configuration changes or the window size changing. For example, a device going from folded to unfolded could crash your app. Now let's look at what it takes to achieve large screen tier three. As a reminder, large screen tier three means your app runs in the full screen on all displays and is fully usable on all form factors. One often overlooked area of support on Android is input support. Android apps on Chrome OS and on tablets are highly likely to be used with physical keyboards or mouses or trackpads. In tier three, your app should be fully usable with physical keyboards, mouse, or trackpads. We'll explore this briefly later in this talk, but if this topic is something you wanna learn more about, I recommend watching Gina and Miguel's talk, the key to keyboard and mouse support across tablets and Chrome OS here at ADS. Since multitasking is much more prevalent on large screen devices, you'll need to make sure that your app state persists when the display of your app changes. This is critically important on foldables. When a user may go from a folded to unfolded while using her app or resizing in a multi-window on tablets or the freeform window on Chromebooks could break your app. The good news is that there are many tools you could use depending on the technology your app is using. For user experiences, we recommend all apps hit at least large screen tier two where you provide an optimal UX for your app on all display sizes and types. Let's take a look at what you can do to achieve large screen tier two. The biggest area of improvement we see for most apps in tier two is around UI and layout. It's one thing to take your existing phone UI and design and blow it up to work in a landscape or tablet or foldables, but it's way better to provide a display specific layout. In addition, we've been working on design specific resources. Take a look at the material canonical layouts design guidance to see what's the most common types of app layouts and how they expand well to all display sizes. Additionally, updating your app's navigation UI is important to provide the most reachable and usable experiences regardless of display size. To learn more about large screen specific design, take a look at our designing for large screens, canonical layouts and visual hierarchy talk at ADS. In addition to large screen optimized UI and layouts, your app should also have improved keyboard, mouse, and trackpad support. For example, common keyboard shortcuts and actions should be supported, such as copy paste, undo and redo, and more. Now that we've learned what it takes to achieve tier two, let's learn more about how apps can go beyond to be differentiated with tier one. Tier one means your app provides an amazing experience on large screen devices. You've done the work to enable new user experiences that are enabled or best on large screen form factors. This is an open-ended tier and use cases will vary depending on exactly what your app does. Large screens can unlock new potentials in all varieties of apps. 
and our team has researched, developed, and published design and layout specifics to multiple app verticals. For example, media apps might be the most interested in tabletop support for foldable devices, which you can implement by observing the device's physical hinge state using the Jetpack Window Manager folding feature interface. Check out the new layout design on our docs under Large Screen Gallery. These are just a few ways your app can go above and beyond to achieve Tier 1. With the increasing variety of form factors and peripherals, I can't wait to see the engaging and useful experiences Android developers provide in their apps. To learn more about the large screen quality guidelines and associated documentation, check out the link in the description. Thank you and have a great Android Developer Summit.
Hello, everyone, and thanks for being here. My name is Rob, and I'm an engineer on the developer relations team. Hello, and I'm Ron, and I'm also an engin engineer on the Android dev developer relations team. Yeah, the same team? The same team. Oh, thanks. I missed that. OK, should we get started? Please say yes. Yes. Perfect. OK, so we used to live in a world where one screen would mean a single activity being displayed, right? Yeah, that's no longer the case. There are two ways in which this can happen. So your users have much more powerful devices in their pocket. And they're actually much bigger than they used to be. So it's perfectly fine for them to use multiple apps at the same time. You cannot really opt out of that. And we call it multi-window. On the other hand, as a developer, you can actually opt in to a specific feature that will allow you to show two activities side by side. Mm -hmm. And we call it activity embedding. Let's start with multi-window. With multi-window, you can do two things at the same time, either from the same app or from different apps. Of course, this means that some things have to change. For example, well, multiple activities being resumed at the same time. But let's, step, let's take a step back. There have been important changes across versions of Android, one of which is the change in lifecycle management for multi-window. While before Android 10 only the focused activity was resumed, with Android 10 and newer, all the activities currently on screen are resumed. And the last one the user interacted with is notified with a flag. Let's see that in detail. Up until Android 9, you would acquire resources during the started phase, update the UI during the resume step, and finally release the acquired resources and stop UI updates in the stopped phase. With Android 10, things change a little bit. You do the same things in the started and resumed phase and stop UI updates in the stopped phase. But there is something new. On top resumed activity changed will tell you via a flag if yours is the topmost activity, which is the one the user the most recently interacted with. So let's see that in code. On top resumed activity changed is a method in your activity that you can override, and this flag will tell you if you are the topmost activity. If you are the topmost activity, you will attempt to acquire new resources, and if you're not, you should actually release your resources, because that means that the user is not interacting with your app anymore. Oh, I lost a beast. Well, talking about this, we need to mention exclusive resource access. Well, we should add an audio effect here, like an something sad. Effect, like something like, ta 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 Yes, that. <laughs> so, that set the mood right. <laughs> Perfect. OK, what are exclusive resources? Well, are all the resources that can be accessed by only one app at the given time, like microphone or camera. Why is that? Well, each app can request a different bitrate or resolution, for instance, or totally different features, like video and still imagery. If you're thinking about a way to get around these limitations, we have bad news. Remember that settings your activity as not resizable will not grant you exclusive access, as Android 12L and newer can force any app to be multi-window. Moreover, as we saw before the break, camera preview will freeze if not done properly and will not resolve on focusing back. Or even worse, your app will crash. Next up, the big elephant in the room. Configuration changes. I mean, we really try to avoid this, but you all saw that coming, right? So when multi-window is initialized, activities are notified of one configuration change, because of course, the size of the window is changing. But it often triggers multiple configuration changes, because orientation, size, position on the screen can all change. The default behavior when configuration changes occur on Android is to kill the activity and restart it, with more often than not, a loss of state, be it window content, scroll position, long operation stopping unexpectedly, 
or wrong position in the navigation hierarchy, all of these will mean a bad experience for your users. <clears throat> there are basically two ways you can avoid losing your state. The first way is to let the system handle the activity destruction and recreation, leveraging on savings and state, view models, or remember savables. And the other is handling a specific set of configuration changes in your code. Let's see how. Well, first, in your Android manifest file, you need to add the config change line in your activity tag, listing all the, the configurations that you want to manage. Then, in your activity, you override the on configuration changed method and run your layout uh, calculation and invalidation in there. And now, I would like to invite Ran to tell us something more about activity embedding. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. So, we've seen how a user can run two apps at the same time, where each app has one activity being displayed. Now, I want to talk to you about a different scenario where we, as developers, we want to show more than one app, more than one activity, two activities in our app. And this is where activity embedding really uh, is really useful. Activity embedding allows you to display two activities side by side, which is great if you want to implement list detail layout with minimum or even zero code refactoring. Activity embedding will automatically choose the right presentation based on the available screen size and the configuration that you provide. That means that you don't need to branch your code to handle small and large screens. In other words, there is no is tablet Boolean. So forget about that. All right, here's an example of a great, amazing application that we've wrote. Uh, it has one activity that just shows a list of fruits. And when the user clicks on the fruit, it launches another activity that shows the lorem ipsum details of that fruit. <laughs> I know it's super complicated. This is how it runs on a Pixel 7. Now, if I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to launch the same app with the same activities on a tablet, suddenly there's enough room to display both activities, and activity embedding will automatically choose the right presentation layer and will show them side by side. But now the cool thing. The library also supports configuration changes on runtime. That means that if the user resize my, my application, activity embedding, the library will automatically switch between showing one activity or two activities side by side. Yeah, I hear that. OK. So let's take a look at how it works. Activity embedding doesn't change the fundamental way that activity ordering on Android works. OK? Under the hood, it creates two containers, or activity stacks, if you will, primary and secondary. The secondary one is always considered to be above or on top of the primary one. That means that if there is enough room, we're going to display two containers side by side. But if there is room to display only one container, the one on top will be displayed. And this is how we keep the same ordering the way we used to have since Android, I don't know, one. Here's an example. Let's say we have an app with a, a list activity on the left and a details activity on the right. Okay? Let's assume that the user clicks on something on the details activity, the one on the right, which launches a sub-detail activity, another activity. And as you can see, when a new activity is being launched, it is automatically bound to the container that it was launched from. Let's take a look at another scenario. In this, in this example, we have two activities, A and B, and for some reason, we decided to give activity B more room. Because it's a foldable device, there's more room, we can display more information, makes perfect sense. However, the library also supports physical changes of the screen. So if the user suddenly folds the device, suddenly we have a different screen, physical screen. The external screen of a foldable device is usually way smaller than the internal one, right? What will happen is that activity embedding will resize and reposition the container, resulting with the same ordering that we expect, that the user expects, automatically. We don't need to change anything in our code to support that. And similar things happen when the user will reopen their, uh, their foldable. Um, and the secondary container will be expanded, and both containers will be displayed side by side. Let's take a look at the code. This is basically the heart of activity embedding, a configuration file in XML. First, I'm going to define how do I want to split the screen. 
The default is 50-50, and in this case, I decided to go with 3070, which sometimes works better on tablets. I also defined a minimum width to trigger a split, 600 dp. I chose this because this is the threshold to move from compact screen size to medium one. We also define that when all activities on one container are being dismissed, the activities on the other containers will be dismissed as well. This means that if the user navigates back on all activities in one container, the other one will be, the activities on the other container will be finished as well. And we define a split filter, which basically tells the system that, hey, if I'm going to launch the detail activity from the list activity, it will trigger a split. Now, we need to inform the library about those rules, and we should do that before any other component of the application loads so that these rules can be applied to any activity that before it, it is started. And we can use Jetpack AppStat library to do so. So we're basically going to tell in Android Manifest, hey, we're going to use the AppStat library, and this is going to be my split initializer class, and we want to implement that class. It's literally those two lines of code calling the split controller, initialize it with the XML file that we provided. The last thing we need to do is add the following lines to both activities, list and detail. That's not a mistake. All the lines that I needed to change in my activities are being displayed right here. That means that I had to change zero lines of code, and my refactoring is done. That was the best code refactor in my life. Thank you. So, Embedding activities from your own app is great and super helpful if you want to design for large screen. But that's not all. Starting with Android 13, you can embed activities from other apps as well. Yeah, I hear that. All right. Cross-application activity embedding um, allows a tight visual integration between activities that belong to different apps. This allows the host application to provide um, um, an immersive experience to the user. Here's a real-world example. Let's take a look at the wallpaper selector that is being um, that shows up. Sorry. All right. Let's take a look at the wallpaper selector that shows up um, in settings. The activity on the left belongs to the embedding host. Basically, it comes from the settings app. The activity on the right belongs to a completely different application, which is the wallpaper app. Another scenario is where we, as developers, we want to allow the user to perform a specific focused task on another app without leaving the visual context of our own app. Um, think about if you have uh, a file browser application and you want to allow file preview, or a chat application and you want to allow the user to watch a video link or URL preview without leaving the context, the visual context of your chat. Now. Allowing another application to embed your own activity gives a lot of power to that other application. This is why this is an opt-in feature, meaning that you need to tell Android OS that, hey, I want to allow this, activi this activity to be embedded in other apps. And there are basically two trust models that you can do that. If there is a tight integration between two or more apps, you can actually uh, specify the SHA-1 certificate of the apps that you want to allow embedding your activities. But some case, in some cases, um, you don't know what the SHA-1 certificate will be. Maybe your activity is designed to be uh, used by multiple apps. Maybe that SHA-1 certificate uh, will change after you publish your app or whatever. So you can decide to go with an untrusted model. Basically, you're allowing any application to embed your activity. And you do that with adding simple line to your uh, activity entry in the manifest. So if you want to go with the trust model, you can use the known activity embedding search. You can define simple string or an array of certificates. And if you want to allow any apps uh, to embed your activity, you can go with the allow untrusted activity embedding, which is a pretty self-explanatory flag, I guess. All right. Um, if you want to learn more, please go ahead to developer.android.com where you can learn how to uh, make your app multi-window compatible and how to implement activity embedding. I also encourage you uh, to take a look at the source code of the amazing fruit app that we've shown here today. 
thank you. And we hope you're going to have a fruitful day today <laughs> with Andrew. Cool. Okay, there we go. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Ben, and I'm one of the developer relations engineers covering Android for Cars. Uh, and today I'd like to talk to you about what's new with the Car App Library. To begin with, let me give you some background on what the Car App Library is. At its core, the Car App Library is a set of Jetpack modules uh, designed to do all of the heavy lifting when it comes to writing apps that you can use on Android Auto and Automotive OS. Right now, that's for navigation and point of interest apps. Uh, but it does so by providing a set of templates that are designed to meet driver distraction standards across the world and which are capable of adapting to all of the different car screen sizes and input modalities for you. It launched publicly a little under two years ago and has only gotten more powerful and feature rich since then. In this talk, I want to cover the major new features in 1.3, um, starting with the map template. Uh, with this template, navigation apps can now also display a greater amount of information and relevant actions while also displaying a map. Um, like the existing navigation templates, you must declare the navigation templates and access surface permissions in your manifest to use the template in your app. Similarly, you're also responsible for drawing the map yourself by providing an implementation of the surface callback interface. With permissions and map running in place, all you need to do is build your map template and return it in your screens on get template method. When building your template, you must supply a header and some content, which can be either a pane or an item list of rows. There are some restrictions on exactly what you can display when these are used within a map template, like not showing an image. Uh, so be sure to check out the documentation for all the big details. Optionally, you can also specify a map controller to enable map interactivity, like tapping or scrolling and other map-related controls. You can also set an action strip, which is great for controls not directly related to the map, uh, such as opening a setting screen or a search screen. Next up, we're introducing alerts to make it possible for users to interact with your app without losing the context of the map and uh, routing information. For example, if there's an increase in traffic, uh, you can ask if they'd like to accept a faster route, or if you're a ride-sharing app, you can see if they'd like to accept a rider. To use alerts, you first create them using the builder and then display them using the app manager's show alert method. Pretty simple stuff. Optionally, you can mark one action as the default to have it be taken if the user doesn't do anything before the timeout you set. Uh, in the spirit of providing more context relevant to your app, you can also now customize the travel estimate. Uh, so this allows you to set an icon, some descriptive text, or both. Uh, to do so, just use set trip icon and set trip text on the travel estimate builder when you're refreshing the navigation template. Uh, finally, to enable in-app voice functionality, we're introducing the car audio record API, which will allow you to record audio from the car's uh, mic. Uh, as with other form factors, you're going to need to get your user's permission before you're able to record audio. Uh, and there's a very helpful method called request permissions that lets you do this uh, using the same code across both Android Auto and Automotive OS. From there, using the API is pretty similar to Android's audio record API, but it's better suited for the cars because it provides the same interface across both platforms. And that's it for the major 1.3 features, but there's a bunch of smaller ones as well, so be sure to check out the release notes for all the smaller updates. Finally, uh, after you've implemented these new features, you'll want to test them out. With the developer head unit 2.0, now available in stable Android Studio, you can test them out easier than ever with Android Auto. All you have to do is use the USB flag when starting the developer head unit, and your device will connect by accessory mode, just like it does in the car. No more fiddling with developer settings and ADV tunneling. And with that, I'd like to say thanks for listening. If your app isn't one that can make use of the car app library, don't worry. Uh, there's so many a way to reach your users and their vehicles. Media, messaging, and video apps are also supported in addition to navigation and point of interest apps, uh, depending on the platform. Uh, so please check out the Android for Cars link, uh, ask, uh, me later today at office hours or the device lab. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Let's talk about improving the TV user experience.
The living room is a great place for content, and with so much more available today than ever before, it's no surprise that one third of US households are watching more than 25 hours of content on TV each week. And our TV platform has seen continued growth and momentum as well. Android TV OS now has over 110 million monthly active devices available on over 300 partners worldwide, including seven of the 10 largest smart TV OEMs, many with the delightful Google TV experience. So now, the majority of TVs being activated in the US are with Google TV. Now, these are great numbers, and it's incredible engagement. But how can we as developers make sure we're bringing the absolute best experience to our users in the living room? Let's take a look at a couple of great ways, starting with an update about Compose, seeing how App Bundles relates to TV, and then some updates and best practices for energy savings and user preferences. In all the great content that we've seen at Android Dev Summit, we've seen how TV Compose, or sorry, how Compose itself results in simplified code that is easier to maintain with accessibility and responsive design out of the box. And you've heard during the keynote at, uh, about modern Android development, and uh, uh, Florina is sitting right there, <laughs> is aligned with the goal of putting Compose first. We're working hard on making Compose to deliver a UI framework that enables developers to build world-class apps. And we're in the early stages of making a sneak preview Android X TV Alpha 2 available later today. While the Leanback API continues to exist as an option for developers um, building TV apps using views and layouts, we're focusing on a few TV-specific components in Compose, and we hope to have more to share about that real soon. So feel free to visit us in the device lab, so uh, also during office hours, so we can just chat one-on-one -on -one to understand how this aligns with your UI requirements. Next, app bundles. They're a terrific way of optimizing your apps on Android, and these benefits also come to Android TV OS. For starters, it's just a great way of reducing the size of your app. By omitting resources that aren't needed, um, apps on average can save up to 20% in size compared to universal APKs. For users, smaller app sizes means there's more space to install apps for storage-constrained devices, which is especially relevant to TV. And for developers like you, this also reduces, of course, the risk of being uninstalled. And of course, downloads are faster as well, right? We've seen an 11% uplift in installs from size savings alone. App bundles also simplify your release cycle, uh, because there's no need for doing multi-APK store listings with challenges like version numbering. And then through app signing, your release key is protected through Google's security infrastructure, even letting you reset your upload key if you've lost it or if it's somehow being compromised. And by letting Google Play take care of app signing, your key is seamlessly updated for the best security practices for you. In the coming weeks, we'll be communicating about changes to the app submission policies and timelines for migrating to app bundles. All told, app bundles single-handedly bring, brings a wealth of benefits to you as developers and also to your users. Now let's take a look at some quick wins for power savings uh, for TV apps. On mobile, we have hibernation mode, which is critical for putting apps to sleep and to save battery. In Android 13, we're bringing these optimizations to TV. And for your app, this means that you will be clearing out data and putting restrictions on background executions if your app hasn't been launched by the user in some time. Not only is this great for reducing energy, um, but we can also save really big on uh, storage as well. Let's take a look at an example. A typical app includes a rather sizable APK. It's cache and optimization files and any user data that it might have stored. So by using app bundles, Google Play can create a tiny stub of just a couple of hundred kilobytes, clearing any cache and avoiding optimization files to free up the majority of app storage. Now notice how the user data is being retained. So users can pick up right where they left off, and they don't have to log in or anything after waking your app from hibernation. From Android 12 onward, apps can receive media session pause signals when HDMI informs the TV peripheral that it should enter standby, for instance, because it's no longer the active source or the panel is switching off. For you as an app developer, respecting this signal ensures that the device can enter a low power standby state. And similarly, our new policies around ambient mode are there to make sure that apps don't, use, uh, don't keep the screen on unnecessarily. 
Now, of course, it's important to keep the screen on while playing content. Makes sense, right? By registering the flag keep screen on, you prevent the device from going into ambient mode and ultimately switching off when video is playing. But just as important, be sure to let the device enter ambient mode when there's no user-initiated video playback. Clear the, flag and prevent your, to clear the flag to prevent your user screen from burning in and also wasting energy. Android 12 and 13 offers users more flexibility in their preferences as well. And as an app developer, there are a few great opportunities for you. From Android 13 onwards, the platform supports hardware switches for camera and microphone, allowing users to completely switch them off. Be sure that your app can adapt to your user toggling these switches in runtime. Audio descriptions are dedicated audio tracks for the visually impaired that describe important bits of what's happening on the screen. A new system-wide accessibility preference in Android 13 allows users to enable audio descriptions across apps. And your app can query this new API in Accessibility Manager to comply with the user's preference to, for enabling this feature. Improved APIs in the Audio Manager allow your app to anticipate audio routes and capabilities from Android 13 onwards. By using this new interface to query your direct playback support, you're able to understand more precisely which playback mode is supported on the currently active audio route. Also in Android 13, users can, uh, can uh, uh, use different keyboard layouts. Now, if you're, gamer, if you're a gamer like me, you might be looking at this WASD, AS, WASD keys and wondering, how can I uh, support them on a non-QWERTY keyboard layout? Uh, in some countries, it might be Azerty or Azerts. And as a game developer, you can now use the new Keyboard Layouts API to map keys and reference them through their physical location. Then let's not forget that users on Android control their devices in many different ways. One such way is through voice commands, like saying things like, OK, G, fast forward 10 seconds, or hey, G, turn on subtitles. There's one thing I cannot stress enough. Users are not interacting with your media app just through the buttons on the screen. Metadata is surfaced, and many media playback commands are done through peripherals, second screens, device connections, and as we've seen, the Google Assistant. So your app should interact with these playback commands through media session. Media session is the bridge connecting content playing in your app and all of those interactions. So let me be clear. You have to use Media Session, or your users will have a bad experience in your TV media app. And to help with this, we recently launched Android X Media 3, making it easier than ever to integrate with Media Sessions, especially if you're using XO Player for audio or video. So let's take a look at a snippet for building Media Session with the Media 3 APIs. Notice how this API simply constructs a Media Session from the activity context in an existing instance of XO Player. See how easy this is? It's a one-liner. By adding a session callback, we can go further and support additional commands like toggling closed captions or in altering the default behavior of commands that ExoPlayer supports natively. With the reference to media session, make sure to release it wherever your media player is being released as well. As long as your media, player, media session is not released, it will be available for the media um, controller to connect to it. If you're, for whichever reason, not using ExoPlayer in your app, I urge you to look into how your third-party media player offers media session support. Now, to make all of this easier, we've updated our media session validation tools to support Android TV. Media Session Validator is a tool that provides an easy and automated way of testing your media session integration and verifying it on Android TV. And if you've written your tests using the Media Controller Test app, for instance, by writing custom tests or integrating it into your testing pipeline, you can use this new TV implement integration to validate um, media playback and avoid any regressions in your existing implementation. Android 13 Beta 4 for TV is available today as both Android TV and Google TV emulators, as well as images for the ADT3 developer device. The release is just around the corner, so be sure to check the release notes to catch up on all the features that didn't fit in today's update. Many of these concepts are not new as Android developers. You know, TV, Android TV OS is an important member of the Android and Play family, and you've seen the hard work that we've done to bring many of the features that you love to TV as well. All right, that's a wrap.
Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the rest of the show here at the Android Dev Summit. <laughs> Hi, I'm Atal, a developer relations engineer on the Android team. I work with Wear OS primarily on tiles and watch faces. And I'm Yuri, a software engineer on the Wear developer team. With the recent and upcoming product changes on Wear OS, you might be feeling like it's a lot of work to build an entirely new app. And it would be if you had to do that. Luckily, in this talk, Yuri and I will show you how you can leverage your existing mobile project to build a Wear app quickly and efficiently. Over the next 20 minutes, we'll show you what we're trying to build, our end goal. We'll demonstrate how a well-modularized project can get us halfway there and demonstrate how we plan to structure our code. Finally, we'll share some features from Horologist library, which can help us build the app quickly. We'll use a made-up example, generic fitness, to provide context about the best ways that you can reuse the concepts, principles, and code with which you're already familiar. We won't dive into health and fitness APIs in this session. For more on that, look out for creating helpful fitness experiences with Brianna and Garen. Our imaginary app is a very simple fitness tracker with one idea. It wants you to do 150 minutes of moderate exercise every week. It helps you do this by keeping track of your workout and reminding you when you're falling behind. It's got two screens, one showing your history and past activities, and the other one for tracking an exercise. We learned from case studies on developer.android.com that other companies had success increasing engagement with their product by adding a Wear app. So that's the reason we're interested in building one for ourselves. We want it to work on its own. Our users shouldn't have to take their phone with them when they want to go to the gym or for a run unless they want to. This means the app should be standalone, with the watch app syncing activities with our backend directly. It doesn't need to talk to the mobile app, and in fact, the user doesn't even need to have it installed. We don't really want to start coding this from scratch if we already have the mobile version, and the good news is we don't have to. The core functionality of the generic fitness app should be the same on Wear OS. Track exercises and see your weekly progress. So we should be able to reuse a lot of code and focus mainly on the UI. It is an app for Wear OS, though. So it should support Wear OS-specific features like tiles and complications, features that don't exist on mobile. A complication is any feature that's displayed on a watch in addition to the time. So here on the watch face, we've got four of them. We've got the date at the top, the time in New York on the right, the user's step count, and finally, the weather. One of the use cases for the generic fitness app is to show the user's progress throughout the week. And complications work really well for this. We just have to provide the data. The watch face will render the UI, and we don't have to write it ourselves. Now the user can see how much they've achieved of their goal. And tapping it will open the app where they can see more detail. Adding a tile will also be a relatively low effort win. Tiles present information from one app at a time and live alongside the watch face, where each swipe will show a different tile. For generic fitness, we could add add one which lets the user start to work out quickly or see the weekly progress in more detail at a glance. For us, it's not a lot of effort to create, but it's something that users who, who like our app will want to see, and it's definitely something that they'll come to expect. In the next section, we'll take a look at how the generic fitness mobile app is currently structured and how this lends itself, where, uh, how, how this lends itself well to adding uh, a Wear app that reuses a bunch of code. Yuri, tell us about modularization. The guide to Android app modularization is equally applicable to Wear. The goal is still the same. Split our project into loosely coupled, self-contained modules. We'll take a look at what this means in practice and why it makes sense for Wear as well. But first, let's remind ourselves about our North Star. What do we want to achieve with our modularization strategy? A well-modularized app has lots of benefits, including the ones shown here. Scalability, encapsulation, reusability. The reusability aspect is, however, doubly true for Wear apps. If we have a single module for Wear or even a single module for mobile, we can't take advantage of the code that's already been written. Reusing the code here will lead to a consistent experience for the user and will reduce the risk of adding new bugs. In your project today, you'll have a top-level app module. 
It contains scaffolding classes that bind the rest of the code base, such as main activity, app class, top-level navigation. This depends, on the, this depends on UI modules, which usually correspond to a screen or a collection of closely related screens. UI modules depend on data modules. Data modules aren't tied to a particular screen. Instead, they encapsulate all the data and business logic for a particular domain or data type. For example, here, the overview module depends on both the historical and current exercise modules because it needs to display both for the overview screen. One benefit to this kind of structure is that you can use underlying modules as building blocks to create entirely new apps. Here, we added a new module, Exercise Demo, represented by this filled box. Exercise Demo can demo just the exercise screen in isolation. Everything else already existed. The result is the ability to build apps without having to duplicate code unnecessarily and, crucially, only contain the code that you need. For where, we recommend the exact same approach. Only add the code that you need. So here, we'll add a new app module for where. We also have to add new UI modules. Compose for Wear OS includes libraries which are optimized for the wrist, so we can't reuse the ones from mobile, and in any case, the screens are going to be different. The new UI modules can use the existing data modules because those are UI agnostic. And if we had a domain layer which can make it easier for the UI modules to access data, we could also share that between the mobile and Wear apps. There's no need to make it device specific. What we end up with is a Wear app writing relatively little code that's specific to Wear. And now Atul will look at how we can lay our app according to modern Android development guidelines. If you've watched the Mad Skills video series on architecture, the next few sections might seem familiar, and that's good. It's because the guidance is pretty much exactly the same. To avoid any confusion, though, I do want to highlight that there is already an API on Wear called the Wearable Data Layer. It's used for direct communication between the watch and the phone, but we're not referencing that in this talk. We want our Wear app to be completely standalone, so any syncing between devices needs to happen via the cloud using the internet. And all of this should happen using the data layer in your code base. So this data layer is the one where your application data lives. It's also where you're going to have the logic that determines how that data is fetched, stored, and updated. The entry point to the data layer is the repository. It's our interface to data sources, each of which work with a single source of data, for example, a local room database or a remote server. Let's take a look at the generic fitness mobile app and see what the data structure looks like there. We saw before that the mobile app has two main screens. This one gives an overview of sessions that you've already done. The other tab gives more detail about individual sessions. The data for this screen is accessible via the historical exercise repository. In this vertical slice of the generic fitness app, the repository is the entry point for the data layer, and it's through this repository that all the data operations will take place. It's backed by two data sources, the database, which is our source of truth, and a remote API so that we can sync completed sessions. The other screen in the fitness app is shown when you're currently tracking an exercise. It shows the user's heart rate and the elapsed time for the session. The data that we track during an exercise is significantly different from what we keep for a past exercise. So this is handled via the current exercise repository. It's backed by the Jetpack data store object, which stores metadata and metrics about the current exercise. And the heart rate data for the mobile app comes from a Bluetooth heart rate monitor, like one of those external chest straps. We create an Android service that has access to both the repository and the sensor data. The service ingests data from the sensor and can persist it via the repository. This lets our UI subscribe to metrics about the exercise without having to deal with the stream of data from sensors itself. And we should be able to use almost all of these classes for the Wear app. But what changes? So instead of an external heart rate monitor, we can use sensors built into the device via Wear Health Services, a platform-level library that can manage health metrics in a power-efficient way. Otherwise, the architecture is exactly the same, and the code is reusable. <coughs> and our UI on the watch this time will still subscribe to changes from the repository, as it does in the mobile app, and it will read from the data store that's saved on the watch. For tiles and complications, though, we need a different solution. Like widgets on mobile, tiles and complications are periodically refreshed at intervals that you can specify. We want them to be up to date 
when an exercise is being performed, but we don't want to set the refresh period too short and wake our app unnecessarily. There's APIs we can use to request updates to tiles and complications, so we can call these APIs whenever there's new data. We made a class called Surface Updater that knows how to update these surfaces. Whenever it's told that there's new data, the Surface Updater can choose whether to request a refresh. Here's what it looks like. On exercise event is the public function that's called whenever there's new data. This class can decide whether to ignore it or not, for example, if one was recently requested. For complications, we can create an update request using the app context and the complication class name. And for tiles, there's a similar API as well. Other screens in our app are simpler and don't need anything specific for where, but it could still be worth refactoring to avoid a little to avoid duplicating code. In the next section, Yuri will describe how we can use domain level classes to combine data from multiple repositories. The domain layer is described as an optional layer in the modern Android development architecture guide. It sits between the UI and the data and is responsible for encapsulating business logic that's either complex or reused by multiple view models. Including a domain layer can help us avoid duplicated logic. In the generic fitness wear app, we wanted to display a chart showing the past week's progress. We also have a tile that shows the same chart with the same underlying data. And a complication and a tile that show, each show the number of minutes exercised for the current week. All of these are representing the same data in different ways. But we don't want to duplicate the logic fetching in each of the uh, view models. So we have two options. Push it down into the data layer, into the repository, or extract the logic into a new class. The problem with moving the logic into the repository is that the data we need comes from two different repositories. We want the historical data from the last seven days and data from the user's current exercise because we want to show the most up-to-date information. So for us, extracting the logic into a class makes sense, the get weekly progress use case. Now each one of the view models for the screens we showed just becomes easier to understand and test because they only have to interact with this one class. The use case itself has a single responsibility, to collate the weekly progress. It returns a flow of weekly progress report, which contains the information needed for us to render the UI. It emits a new weekly progress report whenever the current activity or a historical activity changes. We first fetch all historical sessions and combine it with the current session, if there is one. Now we have a single class that contains the logic to provide data, not just to the four different screens in the Wear app, but also the mobile app. Did we need to introduce a use case? No. When we just had the mobile app, it wasn't worth extracting the logic into, from the view model, and it worked just fine. But adding it helped us avoid copying that code four more times, so it made sense to refactor at this stage. Most of the new code you'll write for Wear OS will likely be UI. We can share most of the data in domain layers, but since your user journeys and UI code will be different depending on form factor, it's the one thing we really can't avoid. Since that's the case, let's focus on making it as easy as possible to develop and test. Apps for Wear OS can be written using Jetpack Compose. And just like Compose on mobile, the same best practices apply. For this screen, we're using a stateful composable that takes a view model as a parameter and remembers its state inside the function. It delegates to a stateless composable, also called weekly progress screen, where all the state is passed in explicitly. This one doesn't have a reference to the view model, and it doesn't maintain any state using remember constructs. Instead, it uses event handlers and state objects, which means it can be easily tested. Having a stateless composable means we can use it for previews in Android Studio and screenshot testing too. And now Atul to talk about Horologist. Horologist is a group of libraries that makes it easier to develop for Wear OS. It's got a toolkit for media, which Yuri and Kiara will present later in building media apps for Wear OS. And it's also got support for high quality pre-built composables. There's also several tools that facilitate code reuse within your Wear apps, tiles, and complications. In the last section, Yuri touched on the difference between stateful and stateless composables. We prefer composables that don't maintain their own state because we can use them for previews and screenshot testing. Even though tiles and complications don't use Compose, we can still apply the same principle using helpers from Horologist. Let's use tiles as an example. 
The Jetpack Tiles library provides tile service. It's the entry point for developing a tile, and it's what the SysUI will use to request your tile layout and your tile resources, for example, images. Suspending tile service is a coroutines-friendly friend, co wrapper from Horologist uh, that sits on top of tile service. It's not necessary to build a tile, but if you prefer coroutines over listenable features, it's handy. And our tile, weekly progress tile service, is the concrete implementation. Horologist in introduces the concepts of a tile layout renderer. Our concrete tile service delegates to its renderer, allowing us to move code out of what's essentially an Android service to another class that's completely synchronous, which means it's easier to test. Tile layout renderer isn't intrinsically complicated. It just has synchronous versions of the tile service functions with all state passes explicit parameters. The renderer is typed. You have to specify the types for both the layout state and the resource state. In this case, they're both the same. We need the weekly progress report state object to build and bind the layout, but we also need it to generate the image resources. Notice how the render tile function takes the state as a parameter and returns a layout. It doesn't manage its own state. This means it's easy to test, but we can also use it to generate previews in Android Studio. Previewing tiles for Wear OS used to be a bit of a pain. You can run your tile on an emulator or device, installing the app, adding the tile to the carousel, and swiping to it. The Jetpack Tiles library does include a tool which you can use to preview your tiles within the Android view system. This meant that you could have a debug activity that showed your tile without having to manually add it to the carousel, which was better. Android Studio Stable now has direct surface launching, so you don't even need that anymore. Instead of launching a debug activity, you can launch your tile directly, and it'll install it to the carousel for you. With Horologist, though, you can preview your tile in Android Studio without launching it. It uses the tool from Jetpack Tiles and the Android View Composable to wrap the tile layout. So even though tiles aren't built with Compose, we can still leverage the tooling that's available to preview them. And because we have the tile layout renderer abstraction, we can just pass the state and it'll render in Android Studio. The chart, though, is another issue. How do you draw it? Neither Jetpack Tiles nor Tiles Material includes any Canvas drawing APIs. But the same chart is used in the app where we use Compose for Wear OS. So can we reuse code here? Absolutely, we can. So the chart itself can be drawn using the by creating a draw scope extension function, weekly progress chart, passing the weekly progress report as state. In the app, we can pass that draw scope extension to the canvas composable. And of course, we can preview it as well. But what about the tile? So I said before that tiles don't support compose. So how do we get the chart there? We cheat, of course. So Horologist includes an API that takes the draw scope lambda, creates a bitmap, draws to it, and finally converts that bitmap to an image resource, which is the format that works with tiles. So while in our app, we pass the weekly progress chart function to a canvas composable, in our tile renderer, we can use the same function to create an image resource. So we covered a lot in the last 20 minutes, so let's recap. Starting with modularization, we recommend treating your Wear and mobile app modules as hierarchical siblings and share underlying modules. Then, we reiterated that the MAD architecture guidance applies to Wear apps as well. If you've been following along with modern Android development, you can use everything that you've learned so far. Finally, we introduced some of the tools available in Horologist that can help you build using the concepts and principles that we shared today. Today's overview has hopefully reassured you that building apps for Wear OS is a lot more familiar than it might have seemed from the onset. If you're going to take away one thing from this session, let it be building blocks. Keep that in mind as you think about existing or new projects and how you can modularize your code base to facilitate reuse of code, not just across features, but across different form factors. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brianna, and I'm a developer relations engineer working on health and fitness. Hi, my name's Garen, and I'm also a developer relations engineer on the same team as Brianna. 
Today, we're going to walk through some best practices for developing apps that incorporate the benefits of both Health Services and Health Connect to create the optimal experience for your users. When it comes to Android's Health APIs, a question we often get is, what's the difference between Health Connect and Health Services? So I'll answer that now. Health Connect is an API and platform for storing and sharing health and fitness data between apps on the phone. Health Services is an API for watches running Wear OS 3 or higher. It configures the various on-device sensors and algorithms for easy developer use. We also recently released the Health Services beta, which introduces a number of improvements to the functionality and convenience of Health Services. So in many health and fitness scenarios, taking the sensor data collected using Health Services and sharing it via Health Connect will be a very common journey. So over the next 20 minutes, we'll show you how to do this. We'll start with an overview of each API, then we'll look at a practical example of Health Services and Health Connect combined, and finally, cover some building blocks you'll need to use them together. Thanks, Bill. Let's start with Health Connect. Think about your favorite mobile fitness app. It's likely this app has got direct integration with a bunch of separate apps like Step Tracker or a social platform or maybe a nutrition app. This helps paint a clearer picture of your overall health. For example, understanding how well you slept last night can help you anticipate how you might perform today. This is the purpose of Health Connect, to give users an easy way to share data between their chosen health and fitness apps. Health Connect is device-centric, meaning data is stored directly on the user's phone, and it's supported by devices with an Android SDK of 28 or higher. Health Connect also offers users a centralized place for permissions and granular control over read and write access for each data type an app interacts with. If you're already developing fitness apps, you may be familiar with Google Fit Android API, which has now been deprecated and will be supported through to the end of 2024. We'd encourage you to migrate apps to using Health Connect before then to continue sharing data. OK, so let's take a quick look at how to get set up with Health Connect. To get started, simply add the Health Connect dependency to your build file, and then you're going to modify your manifest to account for the app's use of permissions. That's here. And finally, its use of Health Connect client. Then you're going to declare the Health Connect data type permissions. So you declare the permissions here, and then later in your app, you request the permissions. So here, we're specifying we're going to read and write heart rate data and steps data. Remember, health data, health data is sensitive, so you should only ever request permissions that your app needs. So the final step is simply to request your Health Connect client instance, and that's all it takes to get set up. OK, so we're set up now, but how do we actually read and write data? Here's a simple example that represents the user's step count for a given time period. The thing to note here is the use of the steps record class. And once we've created that object, we can simply insert it into Health Connect. Another example here, looking at reading data. Note in this case the use of read records, specifying the data type required and the time frame. As you can see, this is an improvement over writing one-off direct integrations with every other app. You only have to write this once, and then you're able to read, write, and aggregate data over 50 different data types from a growing number of health and fitness apps. Cool. So now to Health Services. Health Services provides apps with high-quality health and fitness data through access to sensors and related algorithms. And by taking advantage of modern smartwatch architecture, it can do this in a way that consumes less power than alternative APIs. Health Services has three clients, Exercise Client, Measure Client, and Passive Monitoring Client. So Exercise Client is for workout metrics like distance, heart rate, and speed. It also gives developers aggregates like average heart rate and max pace, all built in. Measure Client is for short-lived rapid sampling. And depending on the capabilities of the device, you can use Measure Client to measure things like heart rate or even blood oxygen levels. And Passive Monitoring Client offers a way to collect all-day metrics like step count to contribute to things like daily goals. 
And one of the major development benefits over alternative APIs is that with health services, you write your app only once, and the API adapts it to differences in watch hardware. So this is a list of just a few of the data and exercise types that health services supports. And I want to emphasize that this list is not exhaustive at all. So I encourage you to check out the documentation after the talk just to see all the options that are available to you. I'll just read out a few now, though. So you have data types like heart rate, distance, swimming lap count, exercise types like skiing, deadlift, meditation, boxing, which I included because it's one of my favorites. And now that we've looked at some of the data and exercise types that are available through health services, let's look at an example of how you would use health services to record a running workout, along with some associated metrics. We'll choose distance, heart rate, and total calories. First, we check to make sure the device has the appropriate capabilities to support this exercise. Now, why is this important? If you advertise your app as tracking a particular workout or metric, then your users will be expecting this functionality. But as I mentioned before, not every app, every device, has the same capabilities. And these sometimes even change with software updates, which is why you should query the capabilities on startup. Next, we'll register for exercise updates. Health services provides updates on exercise state, meaning if the exercise is active, paused, or ended. And in health services beta, which we recently released, in addition to knowing that an exercise is in an ended state, you can also understand why. So this can be something like um, the user ended the workout or permissions were lost, in addition to a whole host of other reasons. And this gives you control over how your app responds to this ended exercise. Health services also packages up the latest metrics and the active duration of the workout. Finally, to start the exercise, we'll build our exercise config with the exercise type and the associated metrics that we want to capture. As you can see, configuring an exercise only takes a few lines of code, and health services takes care of adapting this across devices and supports more than 80 exercises. Thanks, Brianna. OK, now that we've covered these two APIs, let's take a look at a possible fitness journey that could use both. OK, so you leave home uh, and leave your phone at home, and you start to run on your brand new Pixel Watch. <laughs> okay. uh, using your favorite running app. OK, so as soon as you set off, Health Services starts collecting uh, distance, heart rate, steps, elevation, location, a whole bunch of metrics that it's going to cache locally on the watch. And throughout your run, you're going to be glancing at your watch, just checking that your pace is in the right zone, your heart rate is where you want it to be, etc. And whilst you're, not, whilst you're not looking at the watch screen, the app is going to be using health services uh, to continue collecting that data by using a foreground service. So you arrive back at your house, um, and you end the workout. At this point, the app uses Work Manager to upload the data to its server. Waiting to the end of the workout to upload the data minimizes the watch's power consumption. After a bit of light stretching, you pick up your phone and you navigate to the run running app's mobile app to view your post-run analysis. And here, the app writes the running session to Health Connect so that other apps can read the workout data. Along with the exercise session, so the fact that you did a running exercise, it's going to write steps, elevation, distance, speed, active calories, etc. And you decide to share it on your running social media. And as the run's already been read back from Health Connect, it's ready to be published when you want. You then open up your nutrition app, which has also read the run from Health Connect, and you view your updated calorific intake and plan your post-run fuel. Finally, as you settle into the couch, you reopen your, your favorite running app and see that the hydration you logged in the nutrition app is also rendered on the watch app. So this journey I just laid out is a very common one. Perhaps you even followed it to a T this morning before you came to the venue. The important thing to note here is that it involves multiple devices. Imagine running with only your smartphone and using your pulse as a proxy for your heart rate, or squinting at your watch trying to input nutrition data. Pre-Health Connect, this journey would have involved multiple direct integrations and a lot more code. But on Android, 
you can make this journey seamless for your users by using Health Connect and health services together. OK, so putting it all together, even though at the moment there isn't a direct connection between Health Connect and health services, there are a few ways you can pass data between the two. So the first option available to you is to use the wearable data layer, which provides a communication channel uh, for apps and is part of Google Play services. You can use the API's data client to transfer data from the watch to the phone and back again. However, the data layer API can only synchronize data with Android devices and Wear OS watches. So that means if your Wear OS device is paired with a phone running iOS, the data layer API won't work. And so for this reason, we recommend a second option, which is to build your Wear app to communicate directly with the internet if you don't need a persistent connection between the two devices, that is. So from there, simply upload your data to the cloud. For this, you should use Work Manager to ensure that the data is packaged and uploaded at the end of the workout. It's really important for health and fitness use cases that you can't always assume the user has a stable internet connection, for example, if they're out on a hike or something like that. Okay? Once the data is available in your phone app, then you can just write it to Health Connect. Thanks. So an important point to note with both options is that currently, due to Health Connect's restrictions on background reads, your phone app will only be able to read data back from Health Connect and therefore pass it on to the Watch app after the user has interacted with your phone app in the foreground. Of course, we're always looking for ways to improve the developer experience, and these restrictions may change in the future. So stay tuned for updates in that space. With all this in mind, let's revisit the example that Garen shared earlier in the talk. All of the in-work activity is recorded using Health Services Exercise Client. When the exercise state changes to ended, Work Manager helps package the data and uploads it to the app server using the Pixel Watch's LTE connection. From here, once the data is available in the mobile app, the app's Health Connect integration takes care of writing that workout data to Health Connect. Then, once we open our social media app, it reads the run now that the app is in the foreground. And the same is true for the nutrition app. Finally, the newly acquired hydration data from our nutrition app is passed from the app's back end to the watch using a Wi-Fi connection. I'd also like to touch on a few things that you should keep in mind when developing apps that use both health APIs. First, your app should make sure to account for differences in data formatting across the two platforms. The data that you receive back from health services might not be in the right form to immediately send to Health Connect and vice versa. So spend time testing your implementation to make sure the UX feels consistent. Second, your app experience should account for latency from uploading data via the network to Health Connect and back. Finally, consider using Jetpack Compose for Wear OS to develop your apps and for mobile to develop your phone app. And, uh, Compose is Android's modern toolkit for building native UI and makes it you can do more with less code accelerating development. So in addition to using the latest version of Compose for Wear OS, make sure that you're using up-to-date Jetpack libraries across your watch and phone apps. And that's it. We're very excited about how quickly the Android health ecosystem is evolving, so please stay tuned for more updates from our team. And if you're interested in learning more about building health and fitness apps on Android, please check out the other ADS health and fitness talks. There's one on testing health services apps, as well as one on keeping your apps data synced with Health Connect. And of course, review our docs and samples. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm Chiara. I'm a developer relations engineer at Google. Today, we will be discussing how to build media apps on Wear OS. Joining me today is Yuri. Hi, I'm Yuri, a software engineer on the Wear developer team at Google. We know that smartphone users engage with media content frequently during the day, and sometimes for longer sessions. With the increasing number of Wear OS devices available, users now expect media apps to be available on the watch. Moreover, users are increasingly wanting to leave their phone behind, especially for working out. In this session, you will learn how to build media apps on Wear OS. We will start talking about what is the critical user journey for media apps. We will learn how to use the media toolkit 
to ease the development of your app. And specifically, how to build media screens by using the toolkit. We will talk about a new feature called Wear OS Ongoing Activity to make ongoing notifications appear in the watch face. We will give you some tips to make sure your app performs well on Wear OS. And finally, we will close with a brief introduction on how to profile your app to make sure the app performs well on the watch. So let's talk about what is the critical user journey for media apps. The critical user journey for media apps on Wear OS is being able to listen to media content on the watch without needing the phone. There are two ways you can enjoy playback on the watch. The first way is by listening to downloaded media content on the watch. This allows you to listen to media content when you are out, out and about, and you don't have a network connection. The second way is by streaming media content on the watch. Say you're out and about, and you want to listen to the latest episode of a podcast series that wasn't available when you left home. For streaming, you will need a network con an available network connection, such an LTE plan. Now that we know what is the media critical journey on Wear, I will pass it over to Yuri to learn more about the Wear Media Toolkit. Thanks, Chiara. We know there's a lot of work in building a media app. Expanding your media app to Wear can seem daunting, but we've invested in making it as streamlined as possible for you. We've worked with media app developers, Google's Wear designers, and internal media framework teams on a set of libraries designed to make you productive building your media app and providing users with a consistently high experience across Wear media apps. These libraries are open source and published as part of the Horologist project. There are hundreds of choices you'll make when you start to build your Wear media app. Some are more important than others. Which UI components to use? Which media player to use? We've curated the available choices to select a best-of-class combination that should make your apps efficient, high-quality, and delightful. Firstly, Compose for Wear OS is the standard for Wear OS 3 user interfaces, bringing material design and components tailored to the watch. It also provides a delightful developer experience with Android Studio in integration such as previews and animation tools. Wear Compose and the Media Toolkit come with built-in accessibility and translations across all screens. Next, while the media landscape on Android has long been fragmented with various APIs such as Media Sessions, ExoPlayer, Media Player, recently, Jetpack Media 3, which is now in beta, is the unifying representation of a player across Android. A player can be anything, local, cast, or another service on the device. The local player is the evolution of the ExoPlayer playback engine with the widest support for codecs and functionality. And it's optimized for Wear, with apps such as YouTube Music using it, proving it ready for prime time. Lastly, Horologist. Commonly, Horologist is a maker of clocks and watches. But in our case, Horologist is a Google open source project which provides a set of Wear libraries that extend the functionality provided by Compose for Wear OS and the Wear OS framework. Horologist includes specific libraries for media, Everything from volume control, a suite of reusable components for building your player screen, to a sensible room database for storing media metadata. To prove these libraries are production ready and designed for the same use cases, we've built a media sample app. It's based on the existing content for the mobile UAMP project, so may look and sound familiar. We use this to prove out the functionality and performance of our libraries. It's a fully functional app featuring all the complexity of a real media app. The Media Sample app is focused on the offline playback use case, with syncing of offline playlists, fetching artwork, downloading media. It also implements our guidance of media efficiency, such as audio offload. Check out the Horologist GitHub project that hosts the Media Toolkit, and you'll be having a running realistic media app in minutes. The Sample app follows our modern Android development guidance, making it an excellent starting point for your app. Open the project, change the sample app to fetch from your APIs, and have an MVP running in days rather than months. This media sample app also gives us a way to work together when you're investigating bugs. Reproduce in the app, and we can work together with you and the relevant internal teams and fix the bugs. Much easier with a shared code base. What are the major parts of the media app? 
Well, it starts obviously with the UI. Our media activity follows the single activity architecture guidelines using Android X navigation and deep links for each screen. We can directly link to each screen in the app from complications, tiles, or notifications. Unlike on mobile, we're responsible for changing the volume, so we'll need a volume screen. Kiara will cover this later. When we download tracks, we use a download service implemented using Media3's Download Manager and Android X Work Manager to schedule downloads. Media3 starts all the right notifications and foreground services, and we should probably configure Work Manager to run the downloads while we're charging and we have Wi-Fi. Most importantly, our playback needs to run inside of a service, exposing itself to the outside world as a media session. This ensures that your playback can be controlled by Bluetooth headsets, the assistant, system media controls. ExoPlayer does the heavy lifting here. Everything here is probably common with our mobile app, so what are some of the examples that are specific to Wear? Let's look at the first two. With just the watch speaker, your watch is not a great media experience. But with a Bluetooth headset connected, it becomes full featured. That's why our guidance for Wear Audio is to use the watch speaker selectively for alerts or perhaps guided instructions and avoid all use for media such as music or podcasts. But this isn't the default. Like on mobile, if you press play, music will blast out of the speakers on your wrist, startling your fellow commuters. One of the Wear specific Media 3 extensions we provide decorates the ExoPlayer instance and proactively stops accidental playback before it emits sound. We first check the current audio output and whether it's already a Bluetooth device. If not, we'll launch the Bluetooth settings and allow the user to connect the headset. Select new output is a suspending function, so it will return once we've received a callback for the new device. And once we've got a suitable device, we'll call play on the real player. You can see how simple and logical this reusable library code is when layered on top of Media 3 player. We've followed the architecture guides for our media sample app and media libraries, and it shows the benefits and practicalities of this guidance. Sometimes the guidance seems like overkill. Why not use the data layer throughout and avoid mapping between layers? Well, for us, that would mean using Media 3's media item throughout the app. It's a parcelable data object that contains not just artist and title, but also DRM, ads, clipping, subtitle information. Instead, we utilize the domain layer as a buffer between Media3 and our UI. This also allows you to reuse the UI components even with your own custom playback engine. And it allows a simplicity in how we implement our Compose screens and reusable elements. You'll understand when you go to build some custom UI, it's simple and fun. And now Kiara to talk about how we build our media screens. Thank you, Yuri. We learned about the, the Media Toolkit and how it helps implementing Wear media-specific behaviors. Now, I want to talk about how the Toolkit helps building the UI of your app. And I will use the Media Sample App screens to show you what you can easily build. We will start, we will start by taking a deeper look at the player screen, and we will briefly go to the remaining app screens. The player screen is an important screen of a media app, as it provides media controls such as play and pause. This is the screen the user will interact with mostly. Let's look at the code. Yuri mentioned earlier that we follow the modern Android architecture. This means that the media toolkit drives UI from your new models. In fact, in the code, you can see that the player screen has a player view model. The player view model holds the UI state, exposes it to the UI, and handles the logic. The player view model connects the domain layer with the UI layer. Following the unidirectional data flow principle from the modern Android architecture, the media entity state flows in one direction from the data layer to the UI layer. The player view model also holds a player controller. Player control is an abstraction for the commands you want to do via player. Let's say play and pause. User interaction events are translated into commands on the player. And the resulting stat state change flows back to the view model, causing the screen to update and always show the true state of the player. Finally, the player repository models a player. Note that in the Media Toolkit, we, we have an implementation using Media3. 
So now that we looked how the data flows through the layers, let's go back to the player screen. It provides a default implementation of, for the media display, showing the name of the song and the name of the artist in two separate rows. This is easily customizable if you have different contests, such as a podcast. You could replace these two rows with the podcast episode name and the podcast series. Moreover, space is limited on the watch screen, and track titles are often longer than one single line. So the toolkit provides a marquee effect for the track title. The player screen provides a default implementation for the control buttons for music. Similar for the media display, you can easily customize those if you have other type of contents. For example, for podcasts, instead of, of next, you might, you might want to give the user the capability to fast forward to 30 seconds. On the player control, notice how we are using a five buttons layout for the screen. This ensures our minimum touch targets are met, and users can control media easily whilst on the go. We talked in detail about the player screen. Let's look now at other screens for the, from the Media Sample app. So the library screen allows users to find content to play. Notice that to, to help users to quickly find something to play, we recommend keeping the hierarchy as flat as possible. The playlist screen gives user information about what tracks the playlist contains. This screen also contains important user actions, like download, if the playlist hasn't been downloaded yet. And notice how the playlist screen changes when, the, when downloading content. It provides the user the capability to cancel the download, and it shows the download in progress. Last but not least, let's talk about the volume screen that is provided by the Media Toolkit. We use it in the Media Sample app, and you can easily embed it in your app. By using this screen, users can change volume in two different ways. So the first one is by interacting with a physical crown or a rotating bezel. When a user turns the crown, the system generates rotary events that developers can utilize to provide enhanced tactile interaction, interaction to the users. We have implemented support for those events in the volume screen, so that you don't have to learn more about it. But if you want to learn more about how to enhance user experience using Rotary Input and implement it in your app, make sure to see our other ADS talk on handling Rotary Input on Wear OS. The second way to interact with the volume screen is by using a Compose for Wear OS stepper up, up and down buttons with a position indicator on the side. The volume screen also provides a button to show the current audio output. Upon tapping on it, it prompts to select a new one, for example, if you want to select a different headset. So far, we looked at the player screen, and we went through the other main sample app screens. You can easily reuse these screens to implement the media-critical user journey of playing media content on the watch that we mentioned at the start of this presentation. Now that we learned about building screens, let's learn what is an ongoing activity on Wear OS and how to make ongoing notifications appear in the watch face. An ongoing activity is a new feature on Wear OS 3 that allows ongoing notification to appear on additional surfaces within the Wear OS user interface. This allows users to stay more engaged with long-running activities. So media and fitness apps benefit of these features. An ongoing activity shows up in the watch face, and it shows on recent apps. Wear OS UX guidance suggests to always, use, always open the player screen upon tapping on an ongoing activity, as this is a case where a user wants to quickly perform an action while media is playing, such the pause action. Wear OS takes care of creating ongoing activity for media apps. And if you use Media3, you just need to provide an intent for opening the app. This is why in the toolkit, we simply provide a, uh, we simply provide a deep link to the player screen to get the ongoing activity opening the player screen. With the media screens and ongoing activity, we talked about UI. 
Let's, let's now learn some performance tips to ensure your app performs well on Wear OS. A big part of ensuring your app has a good performance is, comes down to optimizing streaming playback. Consider the following strategies. Firstly, optimize the content by choosing a low bitrate for streaming, such as 48 kbps. Optimize the preface strategy for images and tracks to ensure continuing playback when losing connection temporarily. Think about the experiences of users entering the subway while listening to the streaming content and music abruptly stopped. Make sure user has a good experience no matter the network the watch is connected to. And don't forget to test what happens when, watch, when the watch switches between networks. Wi-Fi is the best choice in terms of performances for downloading media content, instead of using the Bluetooth connection on the phone. If a, if a user is on an LT plan, it's, it's a good idea to check if the user is available, that the download operation will, will use the LTE plan, and potentially become an expensive operation. Lastly, users listening to downloaded mu media content should not be experiencing any excessi excessive battery draining. Even if a network is available, limit the traffic, such as sending frequent pings to the server, and choose a suitable artwork image resolution. This applies to downloaded content and streaming. I will now pass to Yuri to learn more about app profiling. App profiling and macro benchmarks specifically are essential tools when you're ready to publish your Wear OS app to the Play Store. More generally, we consider app startup and jank something every developer should be measuring throughout their development. Baseline profiles are how the Play Store optimizes the apps you install from the first run. Developers record their typical app startup using automated macro benchmark tests and then commit the generated rules. The light blue above shows the jank of a debug build on device. The dark blue shows for a minified release build and the orange uh, with the baseline profiles. NATO said on later launches, the orange and blue are similar, but baseline profiles makes your first launch experience just as fast. For media apps, these rules are extra important. Extra load when users first launch your app, fetching playlists and artwork from the network, and then scrolling around your unoptimized app may cause playback issues and a poor experience. So what does producing this baseline profile look like? This starts out as the standard example you can find in the documentation. We launch the app and show the populated UI, in this case, the player and library screens. But crucially, we'll also simulate the user selecting a song, clicking play, and the music streaming for five seconds. We check in the generated profile rules into our repository, and we rely on the Play Store to install our app and activate the baseline profiles. But how do we know it's really working? Well, we can use macro benchmark again to measure our app's performance on a real device. We can see that our app starts up in under 700 milliseconds with a baseline profile, compared to 900 milliseconds without. A worthwhile improvement. But more critically, since we optimized the initialization of the ExoPlayer stack, we see that the time until the player is ready to inter interact with decreased from almost four seconds to 1.5 seconds. And these numbers don't tell the whole story. We'll have less visual jank and avoid audio glitches. But what about the general performance and efficiency of playback? Well, we can create a macro benchmark test to start streaming playback for 30 seconds without the UI. Each of these macro benchmark runs produces Perfetto traces that you can open up with a single click from the test results in Android Studio. But let's open it up on the public ui.perfetto.dev website and see what's going on. This is just the first page of many. Don't try to read this. But what can we tell as we drill into this intimidating profile trace? Firstly, we can see the app, which is configured to buffer 50 seconds of data, is spending 12 seconds loading that data over Wi-Fi. It's using Wi-Fi because our app is specifically requesting Wi-Fi for media requests to download faster and release the radio. What else? We can see it start to replenish the buffers after about 25 seconds of playback. So we might want to tune ExoPlayer to increase that gap. We can also see ExoPlayer keeping the connection open for the next time it needs to buffer. This is designed for mobiles where network connections are basically free. 
These are things for us to fix, maybe prefetching three to four whole tracks in 30 seconds, then closing the connection and freeing the network. Crucially, after making the fix, we'll be able to see the effect directly in our benchmarks. What else? Well, we can see our app becoming quiet once loading is completed. The constant CPU and network activity replaced by a regular beat of activity. As we're using audio offload, the app will wake up occasionally and write compressed audio directly from in-memory buffers and then goes back to sleep. No decoding required by our process. We have confirmed that when playing cached or downloaded music, our app is mostly dormant. Hopefully that gives you an idea about the types of things that you should be looking for when profiling. If this all seems daunting, then don't worry. All of these tests are in place and ready for you to run in the media sample app. That completes our talk on building media apps on Wear OS. If you're ready to start building media apps on Wear OS, check out the project on GitHub, run the sample app, and see the toolkit in action. On behalf of Kiara and myself, thanks for watching. So, you know, bring a chair, pass on along, sort of thing. <laughs> so I get to throw all the hard questions No. <laughs> it's just, um, <laughs> there's a few people who want to probably study for me to give you one. It's a bright light. Yeah, of course. Ooh, yeah, very bright light. All right. It is very bright. That was the end of our live talks for today, but we have one more session for you. Uh, for the next 20 minutes is Ask Android Form Factors. So uh, we'll be asking your questions that you submitted online through the live stream and also take some in person. So our first question that we have is uh, from the uh, live stream, which is, which library do we use for checking if a device is foldable, tablet, or not when using composable functions? Uh, sure, I can take that. Um, first, my recommendation is to not check if the device is foldable or if the device is tablet or not. Instead, check the active runtime environment of your application. So you can use the Jetpack Window Manager library to determine active display metrics to get the size of the display and density independent pixels. And you can also detect for the existence of any folding features like a hinge or anything else that would, who knows what's going to exist in the future. We've seen prototype. De uh, uh, devices with like rolling screens and things like that. All of that information will be available through the Jetpack Window Manager library. Um, so just to recap, don't check if is foldable or is tablet. Instead, check how is your app running, what is relevant to your application's current display state, and use Window Manager to figure that out. All right. Next question that we have is, can you talk a bit about Compose for Wear? What should I do if I already have a Wear OS app and it's not written in Compose? Great question. Uh, can you hear me okay? So Paul from the Wear Developer Relations Team. Um, so if you've, got a comp uh, if you've got a Wear OS app already and you're interested in migrating to Compose, it's a, basically the same sort of strategy you would deploy for a, a mobile phone app. So you can start with certain activities. You can start to bring in Compose and uh, try it out for new features is one of the best places. Um, if your app is relatively small, you can maybe f uh, fully commit to rewriting uh, most of it in Wear OS. Um, there is one really important thing to say on this, which is uh, a lot of the future UI components or the current best practice UI components and the future UI components are only in Compose. So we strongly encourage you to consider adopting it throughout your app, and your best path to that is either taking on features or trying to do the whole thing if, you, if your app is not too large. So. And it's not right for that you'll save both or implementation and maintenance by yeah. switching to Compose. Yeah. yeah. All right, the next one, which I think kind of covers everyone we have up here representing a lot of different form factors. How can adopting new form factors and adopting Compose play together? Interesting. Uh, I'll take the first like, Compose side. Um, 
we've worked through, uh, we wanted to make our Compose adoption story to be very gradual, right? And we try to make it very easy for you to take kind of little steps in adopting more of Compose. Um, but also the timing were perfect in that we were, we were encouraging more developers to look at large screen and kind of the different sizes of devices. I think they go super hand in hand, right? Because if you're already rethinking parts of your app, if you're thinking how to do large screen, then it's a great opportunity to merge those two together, right? Like Compose, as you saw in some of the previous talks, makes it really easy to think about adaptiveness and, and take decisions at runtime that are maybe harder to encode in, in resources. And so using these hand in hand, I feel like it's a great opportunity to, if you're looking at one to look at the other because the path of adopting large screen and Compose is much easier than trying to do one first and then the other. And Daniel? I guess I can add a little bit to that. Just to reemphasize, like, Compose as a modern UI toolkit and UI programming language and model is like really much, much easier to do adaptive and dynamic stuff. And similar to the statement about where, like more of our forward-looking investments will be in Compose. So if you want the latest and greatest layout controls or things like that, Compose is the way to go. Um, and also thinking like ahead about what Compose can enable. Like if you think about like beautiful layout state animations and transitions when going from a small screen to a large screen, you can achieve that with motion layout and views. It's a little complex. Like we're going to be making that much, much easier in Compose in the future. So just kind of thinking about that uh, as you decide what to use for your next UI or your next application. And to chime in for TV, uh, it's also a form factor that I care very deeply about. Um, you know, TV Compose is in the works, right? And we're also thinking about, we've heard your feedback about how difficult it can be to use Leanback SDK and how that migration from a conventional Android mobile app to a, a native TV app can be very tricky. And those components that we're working on inside on Compose are very on the component level, right? So you think about your, your lazy grid and, uh, and that sort of component. Migrating those over to our existing library is fairly straightforward, and there are more components that are really at that sort of that, in, that component level. Um, and then on Wear OS, obviously, we, you know, we've already explained that, that uh, future investments are all going to be in, through Compose. But one thing we are seeing, and, and shout out to Todoist if you're here, I feel like they're, they're here somewhere, is that the expertise you build in one form factor, building the UI out in that one form factor, translates into gains uh, when you adopt a new form factor. So for instance, they had built their phone app first, and then we brought them on to, to using Compose for Wear OS, and they did an absolutely fantastic job. And I think, I think the quote was something like 30% uh, engineering time saved uh, building their UI on Wear OS. So we're, we're seeing those gains add up which is brilliant. All right. Uh, next one is going back to Wear OS. Is there some information about building Wear OS apps with sign in the off feature um, on the wrist? Yes. Um, <laughs> no, so, uh, <laughs> yes, there is. And so one of the main things we, we suggest to developers is to use the same package as your app on the phone. On, as the app on the Wear OS device. And the reason being is then it makes it really easy to send an auth token over to your phone, uh, to your watch app, and uh, sign in seamlessly so the user never really has to do very much to get their, their authentication sorted on the, phone, on the watch app. There is documentation on this on, on developers.android.com. Um, and we can, if you come and find us afterwards, we can kind of talk you through it. There's certain OAuth flows that are supported. And, and if the app isn't already installed on the phone, you can use a, a web URL to be able to sign in through the web. And lots of great tooling there. Awesome. Uh, I think we're staying with the Wear OS trend. Can you tell us about uh, mobile development versus Wear OS? In so, so again, yeah, Wear OS is based on Android. So as we mentioned before, there's a lot of similarities if you're used to uh, developing mobile apps. But uh, Wear OS is optimized for the wrist. And so you should really think about what's the use cases you want to enable on the wrist. So it's like glanceable use cases that takes just a few seconds. Um, and yeah, also think about um, power consumption. You know, how many pixels do you lift versus not? I believe everything is dark mode on Wear, right? So like, we're really trying to, to save you know, battery where we can. So that's a few things you should think about when you're developing for Wear OS versus mobile. Next one, we have uh, which Material 3 component in Wear OS can I use for developing an onboarding screen? Good, good question. Uh, we can, well, it depends on what, so specifically for the onboarding screens, uh, 
come and find me later, and we will give you, um, unless Yuri, Yuri, would you, do you want to take a stab at this one? Shout out the answer, I'll, I'll repeat it. I'm not sure. <laughs> we need more information. Come and see us in the uh, office sandbox afterwards. Um, it runs immediately after this. So. Uh, for a live audience here, too, we'd love to take some questions if there's any that you're uh, dying to ask us all. <laughs> they don't have to all be about where. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, while you're thinking of one, I think we'll move on to the next one here. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you've seen when app uh, you've seen with apps uh, when building for large screens? It's a great question. Um, there's a variety of things. I think one of the biggest things is, uh, I guess there's there's two categories that I would I would say. One is like adopting a large screen mindset and thinking about your app isn't going to be running in isolation. It's going to be used in a multitasking, multi-window environment. The display size is dynamic, not static, at runtime. And a lot of the issues that developers experience can be classified almost as bugs. And this is like the large screen restricted state that we talked about in quality guidelines, where you have continuity issues, or your app um, doesn't resize appropriately. So we have to put it in like a letter boxing motor, a pillar boxing motor. Those things is, is one. And then the other category is we've heard so much from developers that they want us to be more opinionated about what to do on large screens. They don't know where to start. They don't know what to do, and they don't want to go out of their way to do a whole bunch of independent evaluation and research on, on how to make their app better. And so we've been working really hard to provide more opinionated guidance end to end. And so if you look at our large screen app quality guidelines, like that's a, a, a tiered approach to do this first, do this next, do this last if you have the time, so that you can kind of take it bit by bit rather than having to do everything at once. Or similarly, like our canonical layouts guidance, it's, hey, like if you have this type of content relationship in your application, use this layout pattern. And more specifically, here's how it should work, and here's how it should look, and here's how to build it. Um, so those are kind of the two tiers. Is one is think about your app running on large screens and how it runs on large screens. And two is like we're going to try to be more specific about what makes a good large screen experience so you don't have to go do all that work yourself. We'll, we'll centralize it, basically. I think one thing for me is just as a user using an app, like I can, like working on large screens, I can know what apps are doing and like generally can think about that. But it's just a really frustrating experience when you're using an app and then a feature is not available. So I have to know to like go back to the front screen of a foldables to find the feature. Like those are the sort of things where like just if that's not available, it's a com very confusing user experience um, to have. Yep, that's why I don't like his tablet. <laughs> Uh, going the other way now, uh, what are some of the best large screen experiences you've seen? That's a good question. Uh, one that I use a lot personally is YouTube tabletop mode. <laughs> like when I'm sitting at home eating lunch, because I, I mostly work from home, but I go in sometimes, I'll just uh, have my little device on the table. Or if I have a really busy meeting schedule, Google Meet also works in tabletop mode, which is awesome um, from a foldables perspective. Um, anyone have others? I know there are some folks from Meta here today, and they've done a terrific job in WhatsApp on tabletop mode as well. And also drag and drop, some really differentiated experience with drag and drop. Yes. I guess another example, as I was traveling here, I was using like a tablet and a foldable to, to practice these presentations. <laughs> so like using Google Workspace apps and Google Slides and things like that has been really useful on the larger screen device, because I can like see the slides, see the notes really easily, stuff like that. All right. Uh, moving on to the next one, can you also make this, oh, this is talking about uh, visual linting. Um, can you also make this feature available for XML? Although I think that is, yeah. it is for XML? Is yeah. maybe the question is for Compose? OK, yeah, I can take this one. So for those of you who don't know, visual linting is a feature that is XML based. So it automatically run your layouts across different reference devices to check for actually tier two large screen issues, so things like if you're using a button navigation, button navigation bar uh, on a larger screen, or if your button is really stretched on a larger screen. And so we are, given that, that last question also talk about investment in Compose. So we're actively working on investing how we can do this feature uh, for Compose. Because you can think about, like, Compose uh, looks at UI kind of differently. It's more mod modular. Like, you can have a button, you can have a full screen. And so that's something that we want to work on. So if you have more feedback, uh, let us know. Yeah. Especially if you have suggestions for visual lint rules, like yeah. we're constantly trying to add new rules too. Uh, definitely file feedback in Android Studio. Yes. We have another question now. We talked a lot about canonical layouts today. So uh, the question is, it was interesting to hear about canonical layouts and how to implement them. So many options, which might be a bit confusing. How can we know which one to use for our app? 
Uh, I can take that one as well. Um, so one app could use n or multiple different canonical layouts in the same app, but it's primarily driven by the content your application displays and the relationship between content. So in my, like when I was first learning about them, I was working with, with like design folks. And for me, the, di the biggest difficulty was list detail versus supporting panel. But what really helped kind of clarify for me was list detail, the content will have a direct dependency relationship. You cannot have a detail pane without the list item first. Like the list navigates to the detail always. Supporting panel is different in that the secondary content doesn't have a direct, tightly coupled dependency relationship. An example could be I have a primary content that is my main focus and supplementary content that if it didn't even exist on the screen, it wouldn't break the experience where you need to have the detail pane for a, a list of items. You don't need to have the supporting panel content for the primary content to still be useful. Uh, and then feed to me was, I guess, the most obvious. It's like, OK, I have a bunch of things that are all equal in weight, equal in merit. Um, but it's totally possible to navigate from like a feed into a list detail layout. You could have like a feed of items that are all lists, and then you navigate into one, and it's a list detail. Like these, these more complex interactions are possible. Um, and there might be more. Like these were the patterns that we discovered that were by far the most common. There might be edge cases or niche things that don't fit into this model, and we'd love to hear from you if you have a use case you think that doesn't fit into these large screen optimized layouts. Uh, definitely let us know. All right, Ben, I think this next yeah. one's for you. <laughs> what is the difference between Android Auto and Android Automotive? Yeah, so Auto is the uh, projected phone experience. So that can be done either over USB or Wi-Fi. So basically, your phone is powering the experience on cars that support it, which is pretty much every new car nowadays. Uh, and then Android Automotive is where the, 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 the car itself is an Android device. So it's running a special version of Android called Android Automotive OS. Um, for you as a developer, uh, a lot of the work that you do on auto can also carry over to automotive. So you, you know, it's not a one-off investment. Um, and then if you're modularizing well, uh, you, know that you can easily share that code across all the different form factors, um, including both auto and automotive as well. Next one, but switching gears again over to TV, what is in Compose for TV? So the, uh, the release notes are public on uh, the, uh, the Jetpack release notes for TV. So I think currently we're on Alpha 1. Uh, like I mentioned during my session, Alpha 2 is coming, I think, later today. Uh, so I'll just refresh that page. But um, what's currently in it, to answer the question, is uh, there's a, a lazy grid. Uh, there's a lazy row and a lazy column. And we have dedicated components. So why do we have those? I think I should touch on that a little bit. Is that the scrolling and focus behavior on TV is a little bit different than on, on phones and tablets and uh, foldables and, and watches, I suppose. Um, so so those, the behavior that we have there exhibits something more expected for focusability using D-pad on a remote control. And then we also have a featured carousel and an immersive list. So these are uh, components that you typically see in a TV app where featured content scrolls past. You know, It's kind of like fake crossfades, and it has these um, indicators at the bottom uh, showing which page you're looking at. And the immersive list has basically a grid, um, a horizontally scrolling list. And you can, as you scroll through it, it shows some featured content with some areas to interact with, like to engage and uh, watch that piece of content. Uh, as for the future, I can't really say. Uh, just stay tuned. We're still in early alpha. And, and again, uh, feel free to hit me up in office hours, and maybe we can understand like, what your requirements are so I can sort of pass that along to the engineering team. Switching gears again, we have, why is now a good time to invest in building an app for Wear OS? Um, yeah, so now is a, a really great time to, to start investing in Wear OS app because I mean, for one thing, uh, there was this announcement a couple of months ago, uh, last month. There was a um, big manufacturer started producing a watch. Google, that's it. <laughs> so the Google Watch uh, launched recently. But not just that. You know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. What we're seeing is a fantastic portfolio of devices that have started shipping and getting really out there into users' hands. So now is a really fantastic time to start kind of thinking about, is there some use cases in your app that would be best served through a watch, through a wearable device? And if the answer is yes, then, then that's really the time to start looking at the platform and what it can do. There's some really great sensors on watches these days, and the battery life is, is really getting there. So um, it's now, now is a, a really good time to start reviewing your CUJs and thinking about, is there some kind of really useful thing that the user needs to do maybe multiple times a day that's small enough that can be fulfilled through a watch screen? Um, and, uh, and, and obviously, also, there's tooling. So if AK wants to talk about tooling. 
Yeah, we've been working really hard to ensure that the experience in, for example, Android Studio or the whole distributing experience is, is good. So uh, please have a try and please give me feedback if there's something you're missing or something you want. All right. Next one up is, is now an Android equipped with large screen APIs? And I can uh, take this one. Uh, so now an Android, if you don't know, is a sample um, that we have published that's pretty, like, our probably most complex sample that we have right now. You've seen it uh, uh, showcased in a few of our talks. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, it has some large screen APIs, um, definitely like the nav rail versus nav bar in that handling. Um, I think it should definitely have some more. I think there's an open GitHub issue I have assigned to myself right now to, <laughs> to do some more of that. So yeah, uh, I should probably do that once we're all done here. <laughs> and <laughs> and also the window size classes APIs. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Windows size class APIs, navigation bars, navigation rail. Um, I think it should have a list detail, too. Yeah. It's, it is a good example of the feed layout as well. It uses a, a great adaptive feed grid-based layout. So. Yeah, I uh, just want to plug, too. We did release the design file on Figma. You can find uh, there are designs for large string. And so if you're interested in contributing uh, to build a large string for now and please look at the design files. And you can make it yourself, too. Awesome. I think we have time for about one more question here. Uh, how is user behavior changing with large screens? Uh, so a lot of the things that we've seen from app developers when they actually do the work to better support these form factors is increased active user count, increased user engagement, more user time spent in the application, which is really awesome to see, and generally trying to do things that the form factor enables. So I think one of the, the quotes we have is like uh, Gmail launched uh, some UI, sorry, not Gmail, Chrome announced some UI affordance to launch a new window in the app itself, and they saw like an 18x increase in multitasking within Chrome. Um, and so, like, really, like, people want this. People who are using these devices kind of crave these better experiences. And it's a huge opportunity for app developers to differentiate by, by actually doing the work. Um, so I would say those are the big things. Uh, personal usage pattern. Um, my primary phone now is a Fold 4 device. Uh, and I mostly use the inner display for multitasking purposes. Like, it's awesome. Or similarly, like, I love a good list detail layout. It's, like, it's so much better than using the outer display and having to like, navigate back and forth and all those things. So um, just like, it's a much more productive device in form factor. All right. Well, that is all we have for right now. Um, thank you all to the panel. And thank you to all the live speakers today. Um, for all of you out joining for the live stream, uh, be sure to keep watching. Uh, we're going to have more content uh, pre-recorded uh, playing for you there. And be sure to tune in next week as well for the third day of ADS for the platform track. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Michael Stilwell, and in the next seven or so minutes, I'm going to take you through some of the ways to test Wear3 health and fitness apps without breaking a sweat. So imagine it's your job to test a scenario like this. Start tracking a run, run up a hill, run down a hill, and then, after 30 minutes, stop running. Not so straightforward, is it? You get sweaty, it takes a lot of time, it's not easily repeatable, and taking bug reports and screenshots while running is a pain. And how do you check the UI remains smooth while in the middle of a run? There's also a few other reasons testing is difficult for apps like this. Compared to phones, watches have more input types. So there's a screen, but also around 10 sensors. But not all watches have the same collection of sensors. And even if they do, they can have different capabilities. So for example, some watches can automatically pause and exercise if it looks like you've stopped moving, but others don't. Also, there's some variation in how frequently data is delivered to the app. So even if data is being recorded continuously, it will typically be delivered in batches, and the size and timing of the batches will vary from one device to another. One final difficulty is that there's a few unusual states and transitions the watch can make that are difficult to produce, such as your app losing permissions. So there's two broad options for simulating different activities on different devices. You can use an emulator, or you can use an ADB-powered command line API. The emulator works just like the phone emulator and is especially useful for testing UI on different screen sizes. 
You can also pair an emulated watch to a physical phone, or even an emulated phone. The other approach is to use health services synthetic mode, and this works with both emulated and real devices. So here's a quick tour of the emulator. It's accessed via the Device Manager panel in Android Studio, and you can use it to provide fake or simulated heart rate sensor data. The emulator is also useful for testing how your app works on different screen sizes and shapes, including shapes that are not available on physical devices. Another thing you'll probably want to do at some point is pair the emulated device to a real phone to get a Google account onto the device. And this process has got a lot easier over the last few months. Next up, synthetic mode. So the emulator can only generate fake events for the heart rate sensor. However, synthetic mode simulates the behavior of multiple sensors at the same time. To get this working, pick an exercise type and tell health services to simulate that exercise. Health services will generate synthetic exercise data across multiple sensors. To communicate with the health services library, you need to have ADB configured. You may have set this up already, but let's just quickly go through your options, since it's different to how you might do it on a phone. Since watches don't have data cables, for Wear 3 devices, the only other option is Wi-Fi. This works pretty much as you'd expect, although some devices consume a lot of power with Wi-Fi debugging turned on. So remember to turn it off when you're finished. If you're on a network that isolates clients from each other, I recommend setting up a Wi-Fi hotspot on your phone and connecting both your computer and your watch to your phone. This will allow your computer to communicate with your watch without being blocked. So now you have ADB set up, here's how to simulate an exercise. First, enable synthetic providers. Then, tell it what exercise to simulate. As soon as you issue the command, health services will generate realistic but fake sensor data for you to use to test your app. And remember to revert to the sensor providers when you're done. Different devices have different capabilities. This can affect both features, such as whether auto pause is available or not, and also the data types you get back such as where the elevation is delivered when tracking a run. It's very important that your app checks for and correctly handles these differences between devices. Attempting to configure a device to do something it doesn't support can cause your app to crash. So here's some sample code showing how to safely create an exercise config. Note the set intersection operation that ensures only data types that are supported by the device are requested. Another common source of bugs is not handling some of the more unusual health services states properly. So typically, as your app records an exercise, the service transitions through a few different states, from preparing to active to stopped. However, there are several unusual states that are not frequently encountered that your app must still be able to handle. You should verify your app handles these states correctly by, for example, manually removing permissions or opening another app and starting recording there while your app is still running. Wear health and fitness apps typically have far fewer screens and functions than phone apps. They're usually pretty simple. However, they're often used in situations where users expect things to just work, where they don't have the time or patience to investigate glitches. So it's important that app quality is high, and one of the best ways to achieve this is to thoroughly test your apps. So don't skimp on testing because it seems like physical exercise is needed. As I hope this talk has shown, there's a lot of things you can test without doing physical exercise. Finally, keep checking the docs to see if new features have been added to the tooling to make testing even easier. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Ksenia, a developer relations engineer on the Android team. Did you know that on average, users interact less than seven seconds during one session with the watch? In this talk, you will learn how to enhance user experience using rotary input and help users to perform tasks within your app. There are three main sources of rotary input on wearable devices. First is a physical crown, also called a rotating side button. The other two are rotating bezels, either a physical basil that rotates along the outer edge of the screen, or a touch basil that includes a circular touch zone around the screen. Whilst interactions could slightly differ among these types, your app should utilize rotary input for certain use cases. 
The first use case is scrolling through content, which is default behavior that users expect from the app. As content scrolls on the screen, it's important to give users visual feedback in response to rotary interactions. For that, you can use position indicator when scrolling vertically or page indicator for horizontal scrolls. Now, let's see how you can implement this using Compose for Wear OS. Our app has a scaffold, and the content inside is a scaling lazy list filled with elements that can be scrolled vertically. Let's start with adding a scroll bar. Scaffold provides a basic layout structure for Wear apps and already has a slot for a scrolling indicator. Because the position indicator lives above the content, we need to hoist the state up above the scaffold. To show the scrolling progress on the right, we create a position indicator based on the list state object. We can now see the scroll bar when dragging our finger up and down, but not when using the crown. Now let's make the screen respond to rotary events. Scrollable views, including scaling lazy column, already have scrollable state, so adding rotary input support is super easy. To receive rotary scroll events, the composable must have focus. Therefore, the first step is to explicitly request focus using Focus Requester. The second step is to add on rotary scroll event modifier to intercept events that the system generates when a user turns the crone or rotates the basil. Each rotary event has a vertical or horizontal amount to scroll in pixels that can be processed depending on the scroll direction of the container. The modifier also has a callback to indicate if the event is consumed and will stop even propagation to its parents in such case. That's it. Scrollable screen now handles rotary input and shows scroll bar with progress. The second use case is about rotary interactions to adjust discrete values. This can be used to control both single or multiple values. For example, adjusting brightness in the settings or selecting the numbers in the time picker when setting an alarm. Similar to scaling lazy column, Picker, slider, stepper, and other input composables need to have focus to get rotary events. In case of multiple scrollable targets on the screen, like for time picker, you will need to keep an own focus requester for each target and handle focus change accordingly when the user switches between hours and minutes with a tab. And lastly, your app can do custom actions in response to the rotary input. For example, to the min and out or to control volume in media app. As before, to receive events, your screen will need to gain focus. If your component doesn't natively support scrolling or has no UI, like volume control, you will need to handle scroll events yourself. This can be as simple as creating a custom state managed in view model and a custom callback that will be used to process rotary scroll events. And finally, we'll use our callback once we receive the events. Sensitivity of different rotary input sources could vary, producing different amount of scroll events with fixed or floating lengths. For smoothing transition between values, sometimes you will need to rate limit to sensitive events, add snapping or animations for transition. Otherwise, turning speed won't feel natural to the users. In Horologist, we already provide implementation for advanced use cases, so you get a lot of device-specific details handled for you. We have a modifier for scrollable components and for discrete values. Utilities to handle focus based on the life cycle or navigation events and audio UI library for volume control implementation with haptics. For testing, use Wear emulator in Android Studio to simulate rotary input events. That's it. For more information about building apps for Wear OS, check out developer site and watch for upcoming new features in Compose for Wear OS and Horologist. Thanks for watching. Welcome to Developing for Assistant across devices. I'm Jessica, and I'm a Developer Relations Engineer for Google. Hi, I'm Tony, and I'm also a Developer Relations Engineer for Google. Android apps are already helpful every day for users. 
integrating your app with Google Assistant through App Actions can extend this helpfulness even further. App Actions allows users to launch and control Android apps with their voice. So they could say something like, hey Google, order a pizza from example app to Assistant, and the Android app will not only open the Android app, but also to the section of the app that they could start their order. We've brought the Assistant and Android closer together to make it easier for developers to quickly develop and test voice integrations for their app. By implementing app actions, you could streamline user journeys where a user can share key information using their voice and be dropped into the correct section of the app along with any parameters provided. This also helps eliminate the issue of searching through the dreaded sea of icons. When a user queries Assistant without using the brand name of a specific app, Assistant can now infer what app would best fulfill the user's requests and effectively route the user to that app. This is called brandless query. By implementing app actions, Assistant can surface your app content to users. If a user triggers the proper Assistant query for the functionality of your app, even if your app isn't installed yet, Assistant can provide app install suggestions. Assistant can automatically direct users to your Play Store listing to encourage them to install the app and access full functionality. Dynamic shortcuts let users jump into personalized place or bit of content in your app based on prior actions. These shortcuts are created at runtime and can be personalized to the user. Also, during contextually relevant times, Assistant can proactively suggest your Android dynamic shortcuts to users, displaying it on Assistant-enabled devices. For example, if you're building a note-taking app, you may want to push dynamic shortcuts based on the names given of the notes that your users create. For the most critical user journeys, you can suggest the user to create an Assistant shortcut in your app, which is a phrase that triggers a particular shortcut. This is similar to how Assistant shortcuts can be created manually by your user, but the in-app promo SDK enables you, the developer, to proactively suggest and implement Assistant shortcuts to your users. For example, at the end of purchasing our pizza from the example before, you can offer the user to create an Assistant shortcut. So next time they could say, hey Google, get my usual pizza. The Android app opens with the user's preferred pizza information and it's ready to be ordered. In-app promotion allows developers to initiate the creation of an Assistant shortcut by constructing a special deep link that has the app's own deep link parameters inside it. Let's take a closer look at how these user journeys are handled at a high level between the Android app and Google Assistant. You can think about this experience as having two parts. First, processing a user's input and understanding their request, and second, fulfilling the user's request. When the user says, order a pizza from example app, Google Assistant will process the user's input using natural language understanding, or NLU for short. Assistant will figure out what the user wants to do. Then, the app is triggered with the user-defined data and opens to the appropriate app feature to start a pizza order. With that understanding of the high-level architecture, Let's dive in and see the differences when developing for voice across different device types like mobile, Wear, and Android for cars. Regardless of your device type that you're developing for, you'll have to build, test, and release your app. We have three different example apps we'll be looking at as we go. A fitness app for Wear, a to-do app for mobile, and a parking app for cars. The first step in building for voice is identifying your app's functionality and expressing that to assist it. Think about what your app does. What type of functionality it supports? Do you have a game app? Does it have a leadership board? Does your app track workouts? How about searching and viewing news updates? A key concept in machine learning and NLU is intent matching. Intent matching loosely means identifying several pieces of speech pattern for a particular functionality or intention of the user. For our example apps, we'll identify these CUJs and intentions of each device category. Assistant has identified and supports over 60 different intents, which we call built-in intents, or BIIs for short. These BIIs are also arranged into several categories. Google builds and maintains language models for BIIs to understand many common variations of queries related to that particular intent. 
Currently for wear, we support the health and fitness BIIs. While for auto, we support transportation BIIs, like Get Parking Facility and Get Charging Station. We can then combine our identified app capabilities with the supported BIIs to start constructing voice capabilities for our sample apps. For wear, we can use the Start and Stop Exercise BIIs. For mobile, we can use the Open App feature and Get Thing, which are from our common BI categories. Open App feature allows users to request which list they would like to see, whether it's the completed or active. And Get Thing uses the app search to locate a particular item. Now for cars, we'll use the Get Parking Facility BII. Some BIIs use inline inventories. Inline inventories function like a lookup table for BII parameters, expressing the variety of ways users refer to a feature or content in your app into items identifiers that you define. You'll need to define the exact set of words in the inventory that you want a system to look up for your user's requests. These options are declared statically in your app's configuration. A unique identifier for the option is received at runtime as a parameter of the incoming BII. Let's walk through how this is done. Here we have a user saying, hey Google, open to do and show my active tasks. A system will match the open app feature BII and extract active tasks as feature. Feature is the parameter supported by the open app feature BII. In your inline inventory, you'll want to look up the value active tasks in your app's configuration and return the unique identifier of active. Finally, triggering your Android app with the open app feature BI capability to get the fulfillment with a parameter feature value of active. Looking again at our example apps, we can start using the inline inventory to clearly to identify features in our apps for our users. For example, apps on Wear, we'll have the inline inventory item of exercise name. In this example, we're using Run. As shown for our mobile app, we'll have active and completed as our feature inventory items. While for auto apps, we don't need to use an inline inventory. Capabilities are the expression of a relevant feature of an app and contains the built-in intent and fulfillment instructions. Capabilities live in your shortcuts.xml file. Here we have a capability that is tethered to the open app feature BII and our inventory parameter is called feature. To list out what possible values for a feature like active and complete, we'll need to add a shortcut. Within the shortcuts tag, you'll need to add a shortcut for each type of feature. Here we have the shortcut for the active feature. This includes a capability binding tag to the open app feature BII. This tethers this shortcut to the open app feature capability declared previously. Finally, we'll have the parameter binding tag to our array resources that list out the synonyms for the term active. Here's an example of an array resource with the list of synonyms for the term active. It's important to try to capture all the possible synonyms since Assistant treats this as a lookup table. To capture complete as its own feature, you'll need to add another shortcut with the complete task information. Here's a reduced version of the capability and two shortcuts. To have your app know about these capabilities and shortcuts, you'll need to add a metadata tag that points to where your shortcuts files is located and make sure that it's within your activity. There are a few differences when it comes to developing for where and cars to keep in mind. Apps may require additional error notification handling to users depending on the standalone status. Current exercise states are not sent to a system along with the health and fitness BIs. So if your app is not declared standalone, you'll need to build in additional haptic feedback to inform users whether their request was successful or not. While developing apps for cars, you'll need to declare that our car app supports deep links. You can do this by creating an intent filter for deep links in the car app activity. The next step is to tell the assistant how to fulfill the BII that was matched. Now that we have the BII and the inline inventory for features in place, we'll need to add our intent tag to the capability. The intent tag contains the instruction on how to build the enter intent that will be delivered to the app in order to launch it. The parameter tag actually lives inside the intent tag. Note that the naming of parameters between capabilities and shortcuts are important. The capabilities Android name has to match the parameter bindings Android key. 
Here, we're instructing Assistant to take the parameter named feature from the BII and copy it into the intent extra named feature param. In this example, the to-do app uses the value of open app features feature param to filter the list of to-do items by active. Let's take a look at the fulfillment differences for where and cars. There are several locales supported for the fitness BIIs on where, so developers will need to verify their apps fulfill user requests properly for each supported locale during testing. Android for cars only supports deep links, not Android intents. When handling the deep link, we specify the fulfillment implementation in our car session. If a session is not created, an intent to start the app will create the session and pass the intent in the onCreateScreen method. If a session is already created in memory, the session will reuse the same intent and pass the intent to the onNewIntent method. Here, our auto app gets the value of getChargingStationDeepLink when creating a session. The deep link contains all the parameters matched by the BII, so the app can act on what the user said. Similarly, when a session is already created, the deep link will be passed into on new intent with all the parameters matched by the BII. Here is an example of how an Android app gets the value of get charging station deep link. When it's time to test your app, you can use the Google Assistant plugin through Android Studio to verify your app action integrations are configured correctly. First, you'll need to install the Google Assistant plugin from the plugin marketplace. After the plugin is installed, you can use the App Actions test tool. With the emulator and the app installed, open the App Actions test tool and then create a preview. Then you can select the BII you want to test. For our to do app, we'll do the open app feature and change the feature value to active. Then run App Actions, which will open the to do app to active tests. Normally, Assistant gets a hold of your app's app actions configuration at the time of the app's APK is uploaded to play. It extracts the resources from the bundle and readies itself on the back end to listen for the BIIs from the configuration. The test tool preview is a temporary back end configuration that tells Assistant about the app actions configuration to be used for the specific app for a specific Google user account. This means after the initial upload that proves the developer owns the app, the app doesn't need to be uploaded to play each time testing is required. You can use the test tool to preview your app action configuration for aware devices as well as on auto. Now that you've tested that your app actions integration works, you can request a review and deploy. Before submitting your newly uploaded Android app to the Google Play Console, you'll need to accept the Actions on Google Terms of Service under Pricing and Distribution. The App Actions review does not affect your Android app review and deployment status in Google Play. After the app is approved, the App Actions integrations will be available to users of your published or open test releases. We've covered a lot of details on how to add voice capabilities to your apps. Let's recap briefly. Giving users the ability to engage with your app through voice requires the use of built-in intents, the addition of your app's specific capabilities to shortcuts.xml, how the Assistant should handle fulfilling user queries, and this can all be tested quickly with the Google Assistant plugin. Assistant can also automatically leverage your app actions to help guide users to your app through fulfillment of brandless queries and app install and suggestions, all without any additional development work on your part. And when developing for apps targeted at devices other than mobile, there are just a few differences to remember. If you're ready to start adding voice to your Android apps, check out the developer docs and code labs to get started. On behalf of Jessica and myself, thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Allison Chang, and I'm a product manager for Google Play. Today, we'll walk through new features our teams have built to promote your app listing in the Play Store and offer best practices for optimizing your app assets. Your app listing is one of the best ways to help prospective users understand the functionality and value of your app. Tailoring your app's assets to each form factor is more important than ever. Users are increasingly investing in connected devices beyond their phones, such as tablets, smartwatches, and TVs. 
In fact, the number of active, non-mobile Android devices has grown almost 30% in the last year. So today, we're introducing new features that will help your app shine and play across all form factors. Let's start with what's changing on large screens. As we announced at Google I.O. earlier this year, we're redesigning the Play Store for tablets, Chromebooks, and foldables. As part of these changes, we're putting more of your store listing assets front and center in apps and games home. We're introducing new content forward formats that will use your screenshots, videos, and app descriptions to help prospective users get a better sense for your app directly from our Play Home pages. Apps with assets that follow our content quality guidelines can take advantage of these richer formats. This won't impact your app's promotability, just the way your app is displayed in the Play Store. We're also excited to roll out screenshot support for Chrome OS. Now, in Play Console, you'll be able to upload screenshots to highlight unique desktop features. These screenshots should be between 1080 and 7680 pixels with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio for assets in landscape and a 9 by 16 aspect ratio for those in portrait. To get started, you can visit the main store listing section in Play Console. Beyond large screens, we're releasing several features on phones that enhance the visibility of your store listing and improve your app's discoverability. Last month, we introduced form factor specific home pages. This is a dedicated surface on phones for users that have additional non-mobile devices. These home pages improve the visibility of your app and store listing details by allowing users to browse for titles best suited for their smartwatches, TVs, or cars, all from their phones. We're also enabling mobile users to filter search results by their devices. Once users find your app, they can now remotely install it from their phone directly to all their other devices. Finally, we recently launched Form Factor Ratings and Reviews, which tailors ratings and reviews to each device type and enables users to understand how apps will look and feel for them. In 2023, we'll be extending this work with Form Factor Details pages, which will enable you to further customize your store listing information by device type. These changes will make your app assets much more prominent, both on large screens and on phones. So let's walk through some best practices to help you optimize your store listing. You can help set user expectations for how apps will work on their devices by uploading separate screenshots for each device type. Since you can only select up to eight screenshots per device type, make sure to choose ones that demonstrate the actual in-app experience. Focus on core features and content so users can anticipate what the app or game will be like. Secondly, avoid imagery in your screenshots or videos that show physical devices, as this can quickly become outdated and potentially alienate some user groups. If you need to include a device, make sure it's up to date and specific to the type of screenshots you're uploading. If you need to use text in your screenshots, do so conservatively. Since we may resize your screenshots in play to fit certain screen sizes, this will prevent any text from getting cut off unintentionally. Additionally, avoid any time-sensitive copy that needs to be updated frequently. Lastly, use high-quality assets with the proper aspect ratio. This is essential to making sure your store listing looks great on all screen sizes. Don't include assets that are pixelated, stretched or compressed, or improperly rotated. For more guidelines like this, visit our support page about store listing assets at g.co slash play slash asset quality. We hope these features and tips empower you to showcase the best of your app on all device types. Beyond your store listing, don't forget the most important part, building a high quality app experience. Here at ADS, we're hosting a session on large screen app quality called Three Tiers of Large Screen Quality on Google Play. If you can't make it, you can always check out our app quality guidelines for all form factors at g.co slash android slash app quality. Thanks for joining us and for being a part of the Google Play community. Hi, my name is Jeremy Woods, and today I want to talk to you about Navigation Compose on every screen size. In 2021, the Android X Navigation Component added the Navigation Compose module. The Navigation Compose module allows you to navigate between composables while taking advantage of the infrastructure and features already offered by the Navigation Component with other components such as views and fragments. Navigation Compose consists of three main parts. The Navigation Controller, which manages the state of your navigation. This is how you navigate between different destinations 
and it also maintains the back stack. The navigation graph provides the map for your nav controller. This is where you define all of your destinations and how they relate to one another. And the nav host, which is what we will focus on today. So what is a nav host? The nav host is a bounding box container for the part of your UI that should be considered part of navigation. This normally takes the form of a single composable destination, such as a screen that takes the entire space of the nav host. For example, looking at this implementation of a scaffold with a nav host along with the image of a device, the highlighted portion represents the container that is the nav host and where the content from any composable destination will be displayed. So a destination being shown in the nav host cannot take up only part of the nav host. If you want destinations to take less space, you have to make the nav host itself take less space. The exception for this is what we call a floating window destination, which includes components such as dialogues and bottom sheets. But those are still considered a destination of the nav host. They just have their content displayed in a completely separate container floating above normal composable destinations. The nav host consists of everything that navigation is responsible for showing on the screen, but oftentimes navigation interacts with components outside of the nav host that navigation is not responsible for. This includes things like the top app bar, bottom navigation, navigation rail, and a drawer layout. Generally, we can identify things outside the nav host as something that remains on the screen even when the destination changes. Let's focus specifically on the bottom navigation and navigation rail components. Both of these contain different menu items that users can select to indicate to navigation that they want to navigate to a different destination, but they are presented in different ways. The bottom navigation is a menu that is presented at the bottom of the app. For compact width window sizes, you should use a bottom navigation bar. The navigation rail is presented on the side of the app. For medium and expanded width window sizes, such as tablets or foldables, you should use the navigation rail. Both of these components connect to navigation in a very similar way. When implementing a bottom navigation component, start by declaring your nav controller. This will be our hoisted state and allow us to connect the bottom nav to the nav host. Next, we will use the scaffold component and define our bottom navigation composable within the bottom bar parameter content. This allows us to avoid any screen formatting and ensures that the bottom navigation is in the correct location. Then within the bottom navigation, using the hoisted nav controller state, we get the current destination. We won't go into detail here, but we can assume that icons is a list of items that helps us link each icon in the bottom navigation to a destination in the nav host and using the item along with the current destination, you can determine the correct state of the bottom navigation. Finally, in the content of the scaffold, we implement the nav host, passing in the same hoisted nav controller used by the bottom navigation. So whenever the state of the nav controller changes, both the bottom navigation and nav host are updated appropriately and they remain in sync. To implement a navigation rail, we just need to change a few things. Instead of a scaffold, we use a row, replace the bottom navigation with the navigation rail, and the bottom navigation item with the navigation rail item. Then our nav host needs to be defined as the next item in the row instead of in the scaffold's content block. With that, we've successfully gone from bottom navigation to navigation rail. We now have implementations of both the bottom navigation and navigation rail, but as it stands, there's a bit of duplicated code. Let's see if we can clean it up a little bit. Both functions get the current destination from the nav controller. They also need the nav controller in order to navigate in response to some on-click event. Instead of passing down the nav controller, we'll follow best practices and keep it hoisted. So we'll extract out the destination and the lambda for the on-click event. The other major part here is the nav host, which depending on the size of your graph can get pretty large and it would be much nicer if we only had to declare that once as well. Let's extract out our bottom nav implementation into a composable function called bottom bar layout. This takes a destination, an on menu item selected function, and a content lambda function. In the lambda of our scaffold, we invoke the content and everything else remains the same. Now, 
how do we call our new function? The nav controller piece is easy. We just create that using remember nav controller and pass it in. For the nav host, if we just pass it into the content portion, we would still need to implement the nav host every time we call a new function. So we need a way to extract it out and ensure we use the same nav host across different function calls. For this, we need to declare the nav host inside of a movable content of function. What is movable content? Let's say you have a composable lambda that you use multiple times during a single composition. Each time you use that lambda, it is a new instance, unaware of any preserved state from the previous calls. Placing that composable lambda inside of a movable content wraps it in another lambda that keeps up with the state of the original composable lambda. Now, using the new lambda, the state of the composable lambda is preserved each time the lambda is executed. Movable content of is an experimental API added in composed version 1.2.0. It allows state to move within the composition by converting the composable lambda into a lambda that moves the state and corresponding nodes to any new location it is called. When the previous call leaves the composition, the state is temporarily preserved, and if a new call to the lambda enters the composition, then the state and associated nodes are moved to the location of the new call. If no new call is added, the state is removed permanently, and remember, observers are notified. For this, we can declare the nav host inside of a movable content function. Movable content allows us to declare the function just once, and whenever the variable holding that function is called, Compose will continue to use the same object. So our calls to the bottom bar layout simply calls our nav host function as part of the content. We can do the same for navigation rail. Define a navigation rail layout function that takes a destination, an on menu item selected function, and a content, and keep everything in the function the same, only replacing our nav host implementation with a content invocation. Now that we've simplified our implementations of both functions, deciding which one to use is straightforward. Using a when statement that takes into consideration the width size, if the size is compact, we should use our bottom bar layout. Otherwise, our screen size is considered medium or expanded, and we should use our navigation rail layout instead. Since these components are outside of the nav host, they are all considered external state and have to be managed separately from navigation, which is why we need to hoist the nav controller. In the future, with the use of shared elements, it will be possible for these components to be part of the destinations and just shared between destinations that care about them. We've now taken care of the components outside the nav host and ensured that we always use the proper components no matter the screen size. What about inside the nav host? Inside the nav host consists of anything within our bounding box. So any interactions you do as part of creating your graph or interactions within the composable destination that is part of your graph, each of these composable destinations should be able to handle every screen size. Adapting each destination to different screen sizes might be as simple as swapping out a list for a grid, but sometimes the best use experience requires larger changes like adopting a list detail view. A list detail view describes the implementation of two screens, a list containing multiple elements and a detail screen that corresponds to each of the elements in the list. With the compact window, these items are thought of as two different composables list of items for the list screen, and item detail for the detail screen being stacked on top of each other with only one content showing at a time. The user starts out on the list. And once the item is selected, the window contents are replaced with the detail view. But with larger window, both the list and detail content are displayed at the same time in one list and detail composable. The list and detail composable combine both the list of items and item detail composables together in the row so they are displayed side by side. When the user selects an item on the list view, the detail pane updates based on the item on the selected item. Now, how do we combine both of our solutions to ensure we can handle every screen size? What if we were to combine both solutions into a single composable, say, list detail route? that selected the proper destination based on the given window size. If we have a large window size, we display the list and detail composable. And if not, we display either the list of items or item detail composables. Which one we display depends on whether there is currently selected item or not. We now have a responsible composable destination, but there is a problem. 
What happens if we are inside our list detail route and the user wants to go back? Well, if we are using an expanded window size, our list and detail are inside the same composable. So pressing back should go back to the previous destination in the stack. But when using the compact window size, where the detail screen replaces the list screen, pressing back from the detail screen should take you to the list, not the previous destination. Because of our separation inside the list detail route, if we are on a smaller window size and the item detail composable is displayed in the nav host, we can set a back handler to intercept back press to make the item detail composable return to the list of items composable. This type of state manipulation in the nav host allows our app to achieve the proper responsiveness no matter the screen size. But wait, now that your list details are all set up, what if you are on the detail pane and you want to navigate to some content that replaces your item detail composable? This is a rare scenario where you should use a nested nav host. By making the detail pane its own nav host, you can define the destinations that should only be reachable from the detail screen and allow for the maintenance of a separate backstack. If you wanted to deep link to a destination in the inner graph, you would need to find a deep link destination in the inner graph, as well as on the parent destination that is hoisting the nested nav host. This ensures that the outer graph has a path to the destination that you are attempting to deep link to. Here we covered a specific scenario where there are a few things you should be doing in general. The Android X Composed Material 3 library offers the window size class APIs, which allow you to determine the width and or height of the current composable and classify it as compact, medium, or expanded. Ensuring you are properly hoisting state will allow your app to disseminate the proper information no matter which composable is being displayed at any particular time. Using the lazy vertical grid, lazy column, and lazy row APIs will help you take advantage of Compose's built-in support for handling adaptive layout without needing to do extra work on your part. Check out our other talks like Compose Implementing Responsive UI for Larger Screens talk for more ways to make your composable responsive. Again, these things are general practice for Compose and not specific to navigation. So we need to manage the external state outside of our nav host by using the given window size to determine the proper navigation element to be displayed. In conjunction, we should also ensure that the inside of the nav host is configured so that each destination is responsive as well. By doing so, we can develop apps that can truly use navigation compose on every screen size. Please check out our content on developer.android.com and thank you. Hello, my name is Nader Jawad, and I'm an engineer on the core Android graphics team. Today, we're going to talk about how to optimize your Android applications for stylus input by leveraging new low-latency graphics APIs. With over 270 million large-screen Android devices currently in use across tablets, foldables, and Chrome OS, it is a great opportunity to optimize your application's user experience for stylus on these devices. Android has always supported stylus input for quite some time. However, without optimizing your Android application, stylus input could be susceptible to input lag, leading to a delay between when the stylus glides across the screen to when the ink is visible on the display. As a result, the stylus experience does not match the feeling of ink flowing out of a pen. Let's take a moment to identify the sources of latency. There is input delay between the moment the stylus touches the display and when your application receives the input event. There's also latency within the graphics rendering pipeline. Android historically has leveraged multi-buffered rendering. This ensures smoothness in user experience with no visual tearing in exchange for some additional latency between when the application renders content and when that content is visible on display. With this mechanism, the display is consuming a buffer while the application is rendering into a separate one. Android has also supported front-buffered rendering for a number of releases. In this scenario, a buffer is simultaneously being presented by the display while being rendered by the application. This avoids the latency of multi-buffered rendering pipelines, but introduces the possibility for visual artifacts. Therefore, this is not recommended for general-purpose graphics rendering. Enter the Low Latency Jetpack Library. 
This library makes it easy to implement stylus-friendly user experiences. It leverages a combination of front and multi-buffered rendering to obtain both low-latency graphics alongside high-quality rendering without visual tearing artifacts. By leveraging these APIs, you can reduce graphics latency by 50% or more. Let's see how it works. When the user is actively drawing with the stylus, content is drawn into the front buffered layer to minimize latency. When the user lifts the stylus, the content is re-rendered into the multi-buffered layer while simultaneously hiding the active stroke layer. As a result, any potential rendering artifacts in the active layer are no longer visible. Let's see how to use this API. First, we create a GL front buffered render instance by providing our own class type to represent the input data used to render to the front and multi-buffered layers. Then we provide a surface view instance that acts as the layer for multi-buffered rendering, as well as the parent of the front buffered layer. Finally, we provide an implementation of GL front buffered renderer callbacks to specify our GL rendering logic. Let's dig into the callback implementation. There are two methods necessary to support low latency rendering. These include callbacks to render into the front and multi-buffered layers. OnDraw front buffered layer is invoked each time the in-progress stroke is updated. The contents are preserved across each call, so your rendering logic should only render the updates from the last invocation. Finally, when the contents are committed, OnDraw double buffered layer will be invoked and the entire scene should be re-rendered here. This method provides a collection of all the parameters used to render the in-progress stroke. Let's take a look to see how to use the GL front buffered render API. Within our touch handling logic, we keep track of the coordinates of the stylus input events. On each move event, we have enough points to draw a line so we call render front buffered layer to make the front buffer visible if it was not previously and call our GL rendering logic and on draw front buffered layer shown in the previous slide. Finally, when the stylus is lifted from the display, we invoke the commit method on the GL front buffered render instance. This will re-render the entire stroke into the multi buffered layer and simultaneously hide the front buffered layer. Let's take a moment to identify when we should leverage a low latency jetpack library. Because front buffered rendering introduces the possibility for visual artifacts, this should only be used for stylus user experiences. This is not recommended for rendering your entire application UI. And with that, you have everything you need to implement low latency graphics. With hundreds of millions of large screen Android devices worldwide, now has never been a better time to optimize your applications for stylus input. Hi everyone, I'm Alex, and I'm an Android Developer Relations Engineer. I'm going to give a quick tour through insets, what they are, how they impact your app, and how you can use the new Compose APIs to make your apps look their best across as much screen space as possible. Let's first start with the basics. Insets describe how much the content of your app needs to be padded to avoid overlapping with parts of the system UI or physical device features. Because there are different parts of the system UI that may be visible at any given time, there are also different types of insets. These include the status bars, the navigation bars, like the taskbar since Android 12L, the software keyboard, and more. System UI is dynamic, and therefore insets are dynamic as well. How big they are, where they are, and how they change depends on the system configuration and windowing environment. Depending on your device's orientation, which physical screen is showing, multi-window mode setup, or user controllable settings, insets can change while your app is running. Because of this, trying to use a fixed DP value or querying for an internal system resource to get the status bar height or navigation bar height will lead to awkward extra spacing in the best case or make components impossible to interact with in the worst case. Instead, handling insets directly means you can make full use of the screen space available to you and improve how your app looks and functions across form factors. You can also update your UI with animations when the insets change, which is especially nice for the software keyboard. Let's see how you can do that. The first two steps are calling window compat .set to core fit system windows with false in your activities on create method, and setting window soft input mode to adjust resize in your activity manifest. Together, these tell the platform that you're going to handle all insets yourself, including the soft keyboard insets. This allows for the most control and flexibility over how your UI is sized and animated with inset changes. The third step is updating the navigation and status bar color to be transparent. 
This allows the app content underneath to shine through and fill up the full window of the app. Our main tool to handle insets within the app is the Window Insets Padding Modifier. This acts like a normal padding modifier, but instead of applying a raw DP amount of padding, it will pad based on the given type of window insets. In this case, it will add the status bars as padding. The available types include all the ones I mentioned earlier that match up with the underlying platform types, as well as a few safe inset types, like safe drawing. These safe inset types represent a combination of other inset types. Safe drawing, for example, is a combination of all inset types that might visually obscure content. Once you've applied the safe drawing as padding, you'll be safe to draw content without it being obscured by any system decorations. To see why these safe combinations are useful, let's take a look at what happens with multiple window inset padding modifiers. Here, we have an outer box that applies a blue background, and then the status bar padding. Then, we have an inner box that applies a red background, and then the safe drawing padding. Because safe drawing includes the status bars, you might expect that the height of the status bars is added again as padding, but it isn't. The window insets padding modifier communicates with other window inset padding modifiers, and the status bar padding is applied once by the outer box, consumed, and then not added again. Therefore, when we place a spacer, which applies some horizontal padding and finally a white background, it is adjacent to the blue background from the outer box. The red box didn't end up applying any top padding. When window inset padding modifiers are applied to nested UI elements, they will communicate to avoid double padding. If some portion of the window insets has already been applied by an outer component, it won't get applied again by an inner component. There are convenience APIs for the most common inset types, and you can also get direct access to the raw underlying inset values directly with the type objects, as well as additional information about their visibility and filter out specific sides. All of these values are backed by snapshot state, meaning that they are observable and will cause recomposition upon changing, just like any other composed state. Oh, and did I mention that they are also all automatically animated as well? Let's take a look at that in action for handling insets for the software keyboard, also known as the IME. These are handled in the same way as other insets with the IME padding modifier. Let's apply that to our text field here, which we are placing below a lazy column of items. And that's it. We now have synchronized keyboard animation support. And in case you need to know whether or not the keyboard is visible, window insets.isIMEVisible will do just the trick. One more IME specific control is the IME nested scroll modifier. Here we have the same code as before, but now with the IME nested scroll modifier applied to the scrolling container. This will connect the scrolling gesture to controlling the IME opening and closing on API versions where this is supported. To help with handling insets automatically out of the box, Material 3 components now have built in inset support. Scaffold, Top App Bars, Navigation Rail, and Navigation Bar have a configurable window insets parameter to adjust which insets they should internally apply. The default insets these components apply is based on where they are intended to be used and the role they play in your app. For example, the Top App Bar applies the top and horizontal sides of the system bars, the Navigation Rail applies the start side and vertical sides of the system bars, and the Navigation Bar applies the bottom and horizontal sides of the system bars, just like we saw earlier. You can see this full implementation of going edge to edge in action in the now and Android sample. And that's a quick overview of insets and how Compose can help apply them to your app with automatic updates and animations. There are quite a few additional APIs that I didn't get a chance to cover, so check out the docs for additional information about more advanced ways to configure the behavior to fine tune your app support. If you are currently using the insets library from Accompanist, check out the migration guide for converting to these new APIs provided out of the box with Jetpack Compose. The learnings from Accompanist have been invaluable for upstreaming these features, so thank you to everyone who tried them out to give feedback. Thanks for watching, and happy insetting. Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Fuentes from the Chrome OS Developer Relations team. Today, we're going to give a brief overview of why and how to optimize your Android app for Chrome OS. Millions of Android apps run on Chrome OS devices today, and if your app is already available in Google Play, there's a good chance that it's one of them. We've heard from developers who've already optimized for Chrome OS that they've seen increases in engagement and time spent in their apps. 
Before we get started, I'd like you to take a few seconds to think of an app that provides a really great experience for you when you use it on both a phone and a Chromebook. When I imagine this, I envision different experiences between small and large screens, and many of our users will expect as much. Because our Android apps can be run in both situations, let's make sure that we provide a great experience on both phones and Chrome OS. Thankfully, the same work that you do to support other large screen devices, such as tablets and foldables, should cover most or all of your concerns. With that said, there are a few common issues developers run into when they optimize for Chrome OS, and we'll cover some of those today. Be sure to stick around until the end to learn how a new publishing capability can make your app stand out compared to the rest. One of the most important things to do for Chrome OS optimization is to ensure that apps have support for using input devices, like keyboard, mouse, and stylus. About 90% of Chrome OS users interact with apps this way. Some devices don't even have a touchscreen as an option. Support for input devices doesn't only matter for Chrome OS either. It's also common for users of large screen devices like foldables and tablets to use a keyboard, mouse, or stylus. If you only do one thing with your app, try to use it with a keyboard, mouse, and stylus to make sure the basic functionality works without a touchscreen. Once you've ensured that the basics work, there's much more you can do to enhance your experience, such as adding thoughtful focus states or adding context menus to your app. Input methods are critical for our users' ability to interact with our apps, so I highly recommend checking out the key to keyboard and mouse support for more guidance on the topic. Once we're confident that our apps work with common input methods, it's time to think about how they're going to look on a large screen. On Chrome OS devices, users will see your familiar app in a different way through freeform window resizing. You may even be surprised by how your app looks in this new environment. Thanks to Chrome OS's improved window compatibility features, users can keep your app in a familiar aspect ratio if it's currently only optimized for phones. With that said, all this extra space on the screen means there's much more that your app can do to help users. Let's take advantage of it. If you're new to large screen optimization, the topic may seem daunting. To make this easier, we're creating new tooling and guidance, and the effort will benefit your app across tablets, foldables, and more. To learn more about the latest best practices when implementing UI with our new UI toolkit, Jetpack Compose, I highly recommend checking out Compose, implementing responsive UI for larger screens. If you or your design team want to learn more about how to design for large screens first, be sure to check out Designing for Larger Screens, Canonical Layouts, and Visual Hierarchy to learn more about straightforward ways of thinking about designing your UI with Chrome OS and all display sizes in mind. Another common issue we find with device support for Chrome OS is binary compatibility for games or apps with C++ code. Different devices have different CPUs and instruction sets. Because of this, we need to make sure that our app supports all of the relevant application binary interfaces, or ABIs. If you only run your app on Android phones in the past, you may have only focused on ARM devices. However, Chrome OS devices often use chips with x86 architectures. Thankfully, due to binary translation, many Android apps will run on an x86 Chrome OS device even if an x86-compatible version isn't available. However, this binary translation can hinder your app's performance and hurt battery life, so it's better to provide x86 support explicitly. Because Gradle builds for all non-deprecated ABIs by default, most apps already have x86 support. However, if you've written or added platform-specific code or libraries to your app, and you're using ABI filters in your build.gradle, you should make sure that your app has support for x86 devices. It's time to talk about one of my favorite topics, testing. The best way to ensure that your app works well on Chrome OS devices is to try it on Chrome OS devices. There are many affordable Chrome OS devices available and ready to run your app, so I recommend trying your app on one today if you can. If you don't have a physical Chrome OS device, there are still plenty of things you can do to test your app. For example, you could still test a keyboard or mouse on an ordinary Android handset by plugging them in via the USB port. If you haven't tried the new desktop emulator in Android Studio, it's another great option for trying your app in a large screen setting with resizable windowing. 
When you create a new virtual device in Android Studio, look for the Desktop category, and you'll see a few options. Check out the announcement on Chrome OS.dev for more details about the new desktop Android virtual device. And if you're looking for a checklist of things to try out while you're testing, be sure to check out the large screen app quality guidelines on developer.android.com to find a rigorous set of checklists and tests that can provide confidence that your app is ready to shine on large screens. So you already have a great app in Google Play and millions of users on Chrome OS devices are within your reach. How do you make sure your app is available to them? Go to the Google Play console for your app's developer account and check the device catalog to see which devices are supported by your app. It's a good idea to review the supported and excluded lists regularly to help ensure the widest availability of your app. When looking at the device catalog, you might be surprised to see some devices aren't supported. Often, when a device isn't supported, it's because there's an entry in the app's manifest declaring that it requires features that aren't available on the device that's unsupported. An example of where we see issues with manifest entries is with camera requirements. Some of you might be wondering, Chromebooks have cameras, so why is this an issue? The reason in this situation is there are several different camera features that a device can support, and not every device has all of them. In this case, even though our Pixelbook has a user-facing camera, it's unsupported because it doesn't have a world-facing camera. This is because the android.hardware.camera feature entry in the manifest refers specifically to a rear or world-facing camera. If any camera will meet your app's needs, you'll want to use the manifest entries on screen. Note the use of required equals false as well as camera.any. In general, if a feature isn't absolutely necessary for your app, it's best to specify in your manifest it's not required. The camera is just one example of a required feature that could limit your app's reach, so be sure to check out the hardware features documentation page on developer.android.com to see a full list of hardware features to be aware of in the Android ecosystem. Once we're sure that our app is available on Chrome OS devices, we'll want to show potential users what our app looks like on Chrome OS. I mentioned at the beginning that I'd cover a new capability, and I'm happy to share that the Play Console now allows you to upload screenshots specifically for different form factors, like Chrome OS. To learn more about this new functionality and best practices for publishing for various form factors, be sure to check out Make Your App Shine for all devices in Google Play. That's all for today. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out ChromeOS.dev for a wealth of detailed technical documentation, product news, and case studies showcasing how other Android developers optimize for Chrome OS. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to the newsletter to stay up on all the latest updates. And lastly, remember to visit the large screen sections of developer.android.com and the material design guidelines for more resources to help you to design and build for Chrome OS and large screens. Welcome everyone, I'm Gina DeMerg, a software engineer on the Chrome OS team. Today we will be discussing the most important elements needed to introduce keyboard and mouse support on large screen devices, such as tablets and Chrome OS. Joining me today is Miguel. Hi, I'm Miguel Montemayor, an Android Developer Relations Engineer. In this talk, we'll dive into some context about keyboard and mouse support, discuss various tiers of keyboard support that your app can achieve, then we'll examine how to achieve the support at a basic and a more enhanced level. Over the last few years, there's been an emphasis to support touchscreen interactions, which is an important mode of input on mobile devices. However, touchscreens are not the only input type that users want to utilize when accessing their favorite Android apps across form factors. Some of your users might have motor impairments, such as hand tremors, that make touch interactions on your app difficult. Many of these accessibility users fully rely on non-touch input sources to navigate your app. This includes those leveraging switch access, 
who utilize physical switches to navigate around the screen. This slide demonstrates how Switch Access users can navigate the Play Store to select and download a game. The user is utilizing two buttons to control Switch Access. The first is a small yellow button to navigate the screen. As the user presses the yellow button, the blue focus indicator on the Chromebook screen moves to various subviews within the Play Store app. Once the focused view contains the content the user is interested in, they can utilize their second switch, a large red button, to click on the element. Keyboard support is an accessibility requirement that simultaneously enriches the app experience for all users. For those who can't utilize touchscreens, many will look to keyboard support as a way to continue using your app. Optimizing your app for keyboard and mouse support is a great place to begin your improvement efforts as we strive to build for everyone. There are many ways that users want to use your app, including on foldable phones, tablets, and Chromebooks. Tablets are not just used as large screen phones. Rather, users will attach physical keyboards and touchpads or a mouse to their tablets for enhanced productivity as they type and navigate. This could include a user who wants to scroll quickly through a large amount of content on your app, or a user who wants to type out a long message, which often feels more natural on a physical keyboard than a virtual one. Video editing apps would especially benefit from the accuracy that mouse support provides due to the fine detail needed within an editor. Did you know the vast majority of apps available on Google Play are also available for download on Chromebooks as well? As we expand our scope to consider Chromebooks, we see the keyboard is a vital component built into the device. Therefore, adding keyboard and mouse support becomes essential to expand your app's reach across all large screen devices. Keyboards are crucial for large screen users. On Chromebooks alone, approximately 90% of Chromebook users use apps with a physical keyboard and mouse. With that percentage and over 270 million active large screen Android users today, developers have hundreds of millions of reasons to optimize their apps to support the input methods that these users are utilizing on their large screen devices. Google has already done a lot of the heavy lifting to enable keyboard and mouse support in apps, but there are a few things you can do to make your app stand out. Let's look at some of the work needed to achieve different levels of quality when it comes to physical input to support your app. At Google, we strive to support developers on the large screen journey by identifying and organizing key items needed for keyboard and mouse support. In this talk, we'll focus on large screen input. To learn more about other things discussed in the quality tiers, check out the talk, Three Tiers of Large Screen Quality on Google Play. There are different levels of keyboard and mouse support that your app can strive to reach. Tier 3 is the most basic level of keyboard and mouse support where obvious large screen experiences will be functional. Tier 2 builds off the basic requirements of Tier 3 and begins thinking about how layouts can be adapted to utilize large screens. It also enhances the physical keyboard and mouse support that was introduced in the basic tier. In today's talk, we will discuss adaptive layouts at a high level. But for more details on the subject, check out the talks Designing for Larger Screens, Canonical Layouts and Visual Hierarchy, as well as the talk Compose, Implementing Responsive UI for Larger Screens. Reaching Tier 1 indicates that your app is at the best level of large screen support. Not only are your layouts adaptive to large screen sizes, but you've differentiated how your content is received on large screens to optimize the additional screen real estate. Additionally, you reach the best and most enjoyable experience for keyboard and mouse users. Due to time constraints, we won't be able to dive into every aspect of these tiers. However, we've selected the elements most relevant in each tier for keyboard and mouse support. Tier 3 also referred to as large screen ready, is our basic level of support. Some highlights of this category include selecting text with a mouse and switching between physical and virtual keyboards. Tier two, also referred to as large screen optimized, is our next level of support. This tier goes beyond the basic support to add some large screen specific features that will create a more enjoyable user experience. Some highlights of this category include 
tab navigation, setting focus groups, adding visual cues for keyboard focus, custom visual cues, mouse wheel zooming, and hover states. Tier 1, also referred to as large screen differentiated, is the best level of large screen support that your app can reach. Reaching Tier 1 means you've completed all the requirements for Tier 2 and 3 in addition to some additional items. We've highlighted the following categories within this tier. Custom cursor icons and context menus. Another category of this tier is to add a comprehensive set of keyboard shortcuts, which helps create parity with any equivalent web or desktop versions of your app. We don't have time to dive into the code for this topic today, but more info can be found in the large screen quality guidelines. Now that we know what the different tiers entail, let's walk through some basic tier three items together. To create a more native feel for mouse users within your app, it's good practice to make relevant text selectable. At Google, we've done a lot of the work for you to accomplish this. To enable text selection for a block of text, you can wrap the element within a selection container composable. In this code snippet, we wrapped our text object in a selection container. Now, the Android framework will handle the rest for us to enable users to select and copy this text. To ensure a smooth transition between physical and virtual keyboards, you should ensure your app can handle both use cases without causing the app to restart. Switching between these two modes of keyboards is important because a user could connect a physical keyboard while your app is open. On a tablet, this could mean that a user has plugged in an external keyboard via USB or Bluetooth. On a Chromebook, a user might flip their device from tablet mode into the standard desktop mode, meaning that they've gone from using a virtual keyboard to a physical one. To implement this, developers can leverage the Remember Savable API, which will automatically save your state across configuration changes, such as a keyboard being connected or disconnected. By having access to your current state across recompositions, your app is able to handle any keyboard input gracefully. Now, we will dive into the keys to achieve a more enhanced level of support with Tier 2 allowing users to move focus to actionable items on your app via the tab button and arrow keys not only improves the user experience for power keyboard users, but switch access, talkback, and Chromevox accessibility users all benefit from a solid tab-supported navigation. Enabling tab support for quick navigation between actionable items in your app improves your app's user experience across the board by helping everyday users optimize their workflow while also expanding your app to be more accessible. To achieve tab support in your app, you can utilize the on preview key event modifier, which enables you to intercept hardware key events when the component or its children are focused. This is how we can check if the tab button on a physical keyboard was pressed and then request that the focus manager move focus to the next item. This can also be done for the directional arrows as well. Another enhancement for keyboard support is to create more intuitive navigation. This can be accomplished by setting focus groups on the most critical navigational aspects visible on your app. On this slide, we've shown how focus groups create a clearer navigational experience for users. On the left screen, focus moves to all elements in the top row of clickable elements before moving to the larger chips. And on the right screen, focus jumps back and forth between the top row of elements and the chips, creating an unclear navigation path for tab users. To implement the clear order of tab navigation that we've demoed, we can wrap elements inside a focus group, which we've done in this example for the filtered chip A, B, and C objects. This causes those elements to be given a higher priority before focus moves to other elements on the screen. This helps ensure that the order of your navigational elements are the order that keyboard users would expect. Not only is it important to make actionable items focusable via tab support, but it's also important to make the currently focused item easy to see. To accomplish this, you can make the border color of the focused element thicker and optionally update the outline color to better match your app's UI. In the example on screen, 
a red focus indicator is moving back and forth between the card objects in the first column. This focus indicator is a visual cue that helps users easily identify where focus is placed on screen and can improve the accessibility of your app. To pick the best and most accessible outline color, you should select a focus indicator color that has a good color contrast ratio to the background color of your app. A general guideline is that a 4.5 to 1 color contrast ratio will be a great ratio to set anywhere in your app. To implement this support, you can utilize the Remember function to store the state of your object's focus indicator color. You can then utilize this saved outline color whenever your object is recreated or focus has been updated. Additionally, you can utilize the border modifier to specify what DP you'd like your outline color to be set to. Sometimes, developers need to go beyond basic modifications to meet the desired visual specs for their app. When this happens, developers can implement custom visual cues. You can define custom visual cues by first creating a custom indication class, which we named My Highlight Indication. Within this class, we've overwritten the Remember Updated Instance function, where we send a remembered state of the My Highlight Indication instance. My Highlight Indication instance is a custom indication instance class that overrides Content Draw Scope's Draw Indication function. This function is responsible for drawing the actual outline of our custom visual queue. We can then take this code and apply it to the object we want to have the custom visual queue added to. First, create the My Highlight Indication object. Second, create a mutable interaction source object, which controls how the focus indicator looks in various states. Once these two objects are created, they can be passed into the indication modifier. A common way mouse users like to zoom into items is via the mouse wheel or trackpad. Implementing this support is an important way to elevate the mouse experience on your app, especially if your app contains content that users commonly zoom in on. To implement this change, developers store the current scale and the current state as variables, which can then be applied to the object they want to zoom in on via the modifier. To better call out what action a user will interact with, we can apply indication to elements so they will react when hovered over. This will be useful when users are trying to find their desired content and quickly interacting with various elements on the screen. Hover indicators help show users what elements they're about to interact with and help them focus on a single item within a potentially large amount of content on the screen. To implement this, developers can use an indication modifier to store a saved highlight state. First, create a highlight indication, which reuses my highlight indication object we created in a previous slide. Then, similar to creating custom visual cues, create a mutable interaction source object, which will manage the hover state. Pass both the highlight indication and the interaction source into the indication modifier, and set the hoverable modifier using the interaction source we created. You should now have your hover state added for your element. Last but not least, we have Tier 1 support. Tier 1 meets all the qualifications of both Tiers 2 and 3, but builds off this to create additional experiences to help differentiate your app for large screen users. Updating the mouse cursor icon is a great way to indicate how you'd like users to interact with a given element on screen, while simultaneously creating a more native mouse experience in your app. There are many different pointer icons available for you to reference within the View Pointer Icon class. Common cursors include the arrow icon, which is used by default throughout your app. There's also the crosshair cursor icon, which is commonly used when users need to select precise portions of the screen. The text icon, also referred to as an eye beam, is the icon commonly used to indicate an element is editable or can be highlighted for text selection. Finally, the hand icon is commonly used to indicate that a given element can be clicked on. To implement this cursor icon support, Developers can create a pointer icon object using the desired cursor icon type within the view pointer icon class. 
In the example on screen, we've created a reference to the hand cursor and assigned this to be the specified pointer hover icon within the card's modifier. A more advanced feature is introducing context menus, which contain common actions that your users may want to perform on that given screen. These items could be anything relevant to your app, such as editing the given item, opening up the settings page, or directing users to a quick way to send feedback. A good way to introduce this context menu is via a right click of the mouse. To implement the context menu, you can create a box object to hold your context menu. This box object can contain things like text, icon buttons, and more. For the sake of brevity, the code display just shows the box containing a drop-down menu object, which contains various drop-down menu items. Each drop-down menu item contains text, a method to handle the on-click, and optional leading icon. You can place as many of these drop-down menu items as you need within the drop-down menu. Optionally, you can also add a divider object, which adds a thin line of separation between the two drop-down menu items. In the example on the screen, there's a divider between items 3 and 4. That completes our discussion on introducing keyboard and mouse support for apps. We are continuing to expand and deepen our large screen support and guidance. For the most up-to-date information on material design guidelines and guidance on large screen quality, please visit links on the screen or description box. Thank you for all your interest in improving your large screen experience for your apps.